My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. The ministration of the New Testament is the ministration of the Spirit. It has nothing to do with the amount of knowledge you have. It has to do with the Spirit of God that is transmitted into your vessel on account of the Word of God. You may know everything in the Scriptures. You may be familiar with many lines of revelation. But you still never get to a point where you cannot be blessed by the Word of God. Because the ministration of the New Testament is not a ministration of the letter. It is a ministration of the Spirit. And you ask that the Lord will minister to you tonight by His Spirit. Ask Him to speak to you. Ask Him to empower you. Most times our preparations are insufficient for the needs on ground. That is why we rely on God for enablement. You may prepare to preach a message on prosperity. But everybody that comes to your meeting are sick people. If that is the situation, then your preparation is obviously not necessary for the meeting. It will have to take the Holy Spirit to minister to the people himself. And if there is a ministration of the Spirit, even if you say, God bless you, a whole lot of things can begin to happen. And you ask the Lord to minister to you tonight. Mantaso prahashta. Rakabunda rashatala bababuriasa. Liga basho tobara silda basa kronda la giza zapara. Tilo so prahaskila baramanda ha. Rapate ke bundu sa prahaskele bandro baragada bashka. Lika pasu tubre liga subra hasa katila burundra tila kazazua. You are great, immortal, invincible. You are great. You are great. Yeah. 
to my spirit that you've been having encounters in recent times that have left you confused but it is your hunger for the prophetic that is beginning to bring you into those dimensions of encounters the Lord wants to open your eyes the Lord wants to activate you the things I'm saying are they peculiar to you have you had those experiences? The Lord wants to open your eyes. And you lift your hands and ask Him. As you begin to pray, vibrations will leave your spirit. Light will emit from your spirit into the realms of the spirit. And because the Lord has said it, the portals will open. And the, a vote of power will come upon you overwhelm you. Even right now, patience will begin to come to you. As you begin to pray, the vote of power will come upon you now from the spirit. There's a vibration coming out of your spirit mind. There's a vibration. The gates of the spirit will open. The vote of power, it will come upon you like an avalanche. It will overwhelm you. And as you are slain, you will begin to see visions instantly. Instantly. By the Holy Ghost. By the Holy Ghost. By the Holy Ghost. Oh 
among women. Give you 
praise, we give you glory. We give you praise, we give you glory. We give you praise, we give you glory. There's a young lady here who has been interceding for the brother. As a young lady, you have been interceding for your brother. Has all the qualification or the endowment, but talk to one spot. Vagabond spirit coming upon you. God wants to visit you. Just lift your hands where you are. You don't need to come up. Ask the Lord for mercy now. Ask the Lord for mercy. I want to use you as a point of contact for your brother. I want to use you as a point of contact for your brother. And you ask for mercy. And you ask for mercy. Ask for mercy. Ask for mercy. We ask that the yoke be lifted. We ask that the chains be broken. We ask that the chains be broken. Let 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 the chains be broken. of you that your hands are lifted up one of you will start crying crying uncontrollably not because you felt like crying before it's compassion rising from your spirit for your brother you find tears draining down from your eyes one of you
word of God for a moment. I'll just give a brief charge and then we'll pray again for another 15 20 minutes. There are so many churches everywhere. So many persons preaching the name of Jesus. But darkness. Darkness. Darkness is invading every sphere of human existence. It's beyond encroachment. Now it is trespass. Even areas that people are standing for in intercession it seems as if the gate of hell is prevailing in those regions. And it's simply because our Christianity has become much of activities. We were in Uni Greek yesterday, an apostle was teaching us about insufficient witness. And my heart was heavy. Even in the houses of intercessors, things are going wrong and they have no explanation. Every sphere is invaded by darkness. While I was in the presence of the Lord seeking his face this morning, I began asking questions. Why are all of these things happening? Nowadays it's as if people prophesy from circumstances when they've come to pass. The ones that turn out good, they amplify them and say they said it. But most of them don't turn out good. Have we been reduced to just talking, talking, talking? And when I studied the Bible, the mandate that Jesus gave us was not to talk about him. It was to be a witness. As I besought the Lord, the Lord told me two things. It's every manifestation that we see on the earth realm is a revelation of the spirit that is prevalently domiciled in such sphere of reality. The earth realm have no capacity to bet or to give rise to civilizations, to realities. Because principally what we call civilizations are actually characteristics of spirits. So when a spiritual entity invades a territory, just in case you don't have sufficient discernment to tell the spirit that have invaded that territory, just look upon the people and see the things that are happening. Then you will tell the spirit whose government is in operation. So when you see fornication and adultery littered everywhere, it simply tells that an immoral spirit have taken over the authority of that sphere. When you see violence, when you see killing, you don't need to go too far. It's because the spirit is sitting upon the people. The manifestations we see on the earth are unveilings of governments that are playing out through human entities. If you study the book of Daniel chapter 1, chapter 10, verse 20 and 21, you see that as Daniel was interceding for the people, the angel Gabriel appeared to him. And the angel Gabriel told him, after unveiling a lot of things to him, and telling him the mind of God, the angel Gabriel told him that as he is departing from him, he said, the prince of Persia will come. And he said, when the prince of Persia is gone, the prince of Grecia will come. If you track back to human history, you will discover that these beings that the angel called princes were actually different civilizations that hit the earth realm. 
So in the realm of the spirit, what you call a manifestation of a season is actually a prince that was enthroned by time. So the things that are happening within the regions of our habitation is an indication that a new Lord has been enthroned over the souls of men. You know, when this violence begins and you come to a church and they say, let's pray, let's pray, you begin to wonder, which role has prayer got to do with what is happening? They are killing people, you say, let's pray. We need to buy guns. What, what is prayer in this matter? If you succeed in unseating the prince over the territory, what will happen is that that thing that you saw buffeting the people will die down, will die a natural death. So you don't address the matter from the manifestation. You address the matter from the root. At least the doctors know as much. Today I've not come to preach, so I may not necessarily be charismatic. I just want to tell you a few principles that we need to consciously begin to practice. Because we have too much activity, but we don't have men. We come to a gathering of 30,000 people, but you can't entrust a territory to any of them. But it was not there, it was also in the days of the apostles. In the days of the apostles, the apostles would sit in Jerusalem and Philip would go to Samaria. He was a deacon. He was not an apostle. And the Bible said he preached Christ there. And the city was filled with joy. He said demons were cast out. The lame were walking. Signs and wonders is not a prerogative of the apostles. It is the birthright of the believer. And I discovered that when these things are happening, the reason it becomes difficult to stop them is because before a prince is enthroned, what happens is that the elders are taken away from the scene. The Bible said in Isaiah chapter 3 from verse 1, he said he will break the staff of bread. He will remove the elders, the orators, the captains of fifty, the mighty men of valor. He will remove them and then he will have babes as their leaders. The reason a prince can come to sit over a territory and lord over the people is because the elders have been removed from such systems. So there is nobody to give perspectives that are consistent with the purposes of God. Everybody is talking, but no one knows the heart of the Father. You see, John was writing. In 1 John chapter 2, from verse 14, he said, I write unto you, children, because you have believed the Father. He said, I write unto you, young men, because you are strong and you have overcome the wicked one. He said, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. The difference between a child, a grown-up Christian, and a father is that the child has been admitted into the kingdom. He has legal authority to be a child, a son in the kingdom. It's just like biological birth. But the one that is grown up has not just been adopted into the kingdom. He has learned one or two things in the kingdom and he has known how to exercise the powers and the authorities that are in the kingdom in order to subdue the evil one. But the fathers are not so. The fathers are the ones that have traveled into the spirit. On account of their workings with God, they have the capacity to look into the archives of heaven. And they can begin to read out the seasons and the purposes of God for that dispensation. So when a young man stands with a father in a meeting, the young man can be carried away by manifestations because he, he has faith. He's using the tools of the spirit and he's enjoying his mastery over the weaponry of spiritual authority and power. But the father is not at that level anymore. A father can come to a meeting and see people sick. But what God is saying at that time is to address matters of the heart. So even though he's seen a lot of things on ground, he knows what God wants to do at that time 
So it's what God wants to do, he will do. And he will go away and he will not be under pressure. So when the fathers are lacking, you will see a lot of activities on ground. But the whole land will be in captivity. That's why you see there are many prophets talking, calling people's names and phone numbers. But nobody can give us the accurate perspective as to what God wants to do in this season. There are a lot of healing evangelists. I was thinking that when the young ladies were captured by the Boko Haram terrorists, all our forensic prophets will tell us the best strategy to do to get them back and what to do to get the Boko Haram agents and all of that. But it dawned on me that forensic prophecy was incapacitated. So you can live in the house of a prophet, but things will go wrong, he's not even aware. But he has trained his spiritual senses to know how to pick a name in the spirit. But he doesn't know what is in the mind of God. There are babes on the altar. There are babes in the body. There are babes in The making of a deliverer. These were the things the Lord was ministering to my spirit. The making of a deliverer. I'm consciously taking it very slow. I don't want my soul to ascend. Because it's not about charismatic talking. I want you to hear the principles and to apply them. So that in no distant time from now, every one of us can stand and defend the gates of Zion. Every one of us can become a representative of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. How many of you here are in families that there are no challenges, obvious challenges? How many of you here are in families that you have been praying for those challenges and you have not recorded as much as a testimony? We need understanding. I came to discover it's not about praying. I came to discover it's not about study of the word. It dawned on me in recent time that you have to be made by God. You see the reference Pastor Tony gave. The message the apostle preached in Uniagric on the first day. If you are not careful, you may wonder if anything will happen here. But he finished preaching that message and he just prayed for deaf people. And more than 11 persons were healed instantly. So it, I discovered it's not about prayers. Because if I prayed those prayers, not one person might be healed. So there's something involved. Prayer is part of that thing. And until you are made by prayers to become that thing, you cannot orchestrate deliverance. There is a making of a deliverer. If every one of us here is transformed into our true elements in the spirit, a lot of things will change. We have gained mastery in things. So if somebody is coming up, you know the person has a good voice, so he will sing in so and so fashion. There is no leading of the spirit. For instance, if Pastor Mike is coming up, you are expecting him to speak some fluent English and you can predict him like that for 10 meetings. And he will come for 10 meetings and operate like that because there's no leading of the Holy Ghost. It was not so in the days of the apostles. And these guys didn't know so much. The church in Galatia only had the teachings of Paul and the letter of the Galatians. They didn't know what Paul was writing to the Corinthians. They didn't know what Paul was writing to the people in Ephesus. All they had was the letter they had and the Old Testament. The church in Ephesus did not know what Paul was writing to Galatia. Neither did, not, did they know what Peter was writing. They only had that letter 
with the book of the Old Testament. But the Bible said of the exploits that they did. You have a compendium of all the writings that have been given to these people. I have listened to apostles' messages from 2010 till date. The ones that are on tape. And I heard some more than 20 times. But I'm still where I am. So it's not even about knowledge. What you become is a function of your alignment, your submission, your followership to that movement of the spirit on your inside. If you don't follow the leadership of the Holy Ghost and subject yourself to that government, you will do your own activity and remain where you are. You may be coming for a meeting and expect some sensations and you will enjoy them and go back home and be the way you are. And a preacher may even be coming for a meeting and want to do the things he knows he knows how to do. And he will do it and he will be applauded. But nobody will be changed. That is because we know the principles, we know the acts, but we don't know the person. In the days of old, they knew the people. They knew the person in the spirit. What we are reading as principle was what they did while they were following the person. Are we to discard it? No. Because the Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it said the things that happened to them, it happened for an example, and they are written for us, unto whom the end of the age is come. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it said, the things that are written at four times, they were written for our learning, so that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So we study after them to understand the ways of God. But beyond our study, we must know the person of God, because there is a distinct syllable for every one of us. Hallelujah. How many of us here know God on a personal basis? Personal basis. Who is God to you? You will quote what God was to Abraham. You will quote what God was to Paul. That's because you don't have a work with God. The names that these guys called God were not written anywhere. They were the products of their encounters with God. So in order to immortalize it, they gave it a title so that their children will know that God did this. So when you say Jehovah Rophel, they want their children to know that God is a healer. It's not because that is his name. And you may pass through time and you will not know God enough to even give him a name. Because you don't have a work with him. And that is why we are weak. I can come here and quote more than 1,000 scriptures and tell you who God was to more than 500 people. But I don't know God as a person. <laughs> when you stand behind this pulpit, it's not the God of Paul you will call. It's not the God of Peter. It's your own God. We are weak because we don't know God. And we don't know God because we are rebellious. Every one of us must follow our own definite path in order to be made into deliverance. And until the day of the emergence of the deliverance, and we have prayed for as much as five years. And every day you come for prayer, you have to be motivated, you have to be charged. Even the prayer that you are carrying out every day is still an activity. And you only pray when you come to a congregational meeting. What does it take to travel from where you are to where you should be? These are the things that are lacking. When we come for meetings, we want to hear charismatic things jump. Ah! You will do that, enjoy yourself, but on the, in the day of trouble, you will do those same things, there will be no change. Then you start running around. That's why people can go to see a prophet and they will lie outside for three weeks and they are on appointment to see a prophet. But they cannot wait in God's presence for three hours. Because our doctrines are erroneous. If these things you are doing cannot save you, stop doing them. You are wasting your time. If the prayer you are praying now cannot make you change anything, don't waste your time. Better start, doing, looking, start looking for what you will do that has the capacity to change because the day of trouble is coming to every one of us. 
That the evil day have not reached you does not mean it will not come. And the Bible says if you faint in the day of trouble, it means your strength is small. Not because God is incapable. And if you believe what you are doing is the right thing to do, you better plunge yourself into it. You better plunge yourself into it. Because I don't know why somebody will leave his house, sacrifice three hours, come for a prayer meeting, and they are praying, the person is not praying. Is it not a deception of the devil? You left your house, left your business, left everything, shut down, came for three hours, and then you are, they are praying, you are not praying. If you don't believe in the prayer, stop. Start looking for what you believe in. And if you believe in the prayer, better pump yourself into it. We have turned Christianity into a lie. So you tell somebody to send a text message. He's sending a message that is a power meeting. Even him that is sending a message doesn't believe. He, but he's, he's looking for the right words, the right words. How to phrase it, how to coin it. It's a power and a miraculous meeting. But he doesn't believe. Because he's sick and he's coming for that meeting. He has no expectation. That's the kind of Christianity we are practicing. And all of these are possible because we don't know God. There were times when I went for meetings without praying. I knew what to say to set the people on fire. And it had always worked. But transformation is beyond setting people on fire. They must encounter the God of fire. In the making of a deliverer, there are a few, few layers of dealings you must have to pass through. If you have not passed through there, your journey has not begun. At least your journey of purpose has not begun. The first one is the wilderness experience. The first one is the wilderness experience. What is the wilderness experience? And what is the purpose of the wilderness experience? The wilderness experience is actually a set of circumstances that God passes you through. So that you come to a place where there is nothing you hold on to anymore. You are forced to look unto God alone. It is in the wilderness that all your options are taken away. The Bible said in Exodus, book of Exodus chapter 13 from verse 17, he said when they left Egypt, he did not let them go through the way of the Philistines. He said even though that was short, because if they went through that way, they will find war and they will come back. He said, but he let them pass through the way of the Red Sea, even though it was longer. That is when all the garbages in your life are shoved off. You may tell yourself and pray for many days, many months, and many years, and you will even be crying when praying that, Lord, I trust you. You are my only hope. But the moment you finish praying, the first person you call is your uncle. <laughs> you see how slippery the deception is. Even while you were praying, you knew your confidence was in your uncle. <laughs> you will do these things for many years, but you will not grow. Because somebody say you lie loudest when you lie to yourself. Somebody needs that and say, I believe in God now. I will do it now. Now. And the moment he leaves that place, he's going to look for alternatives. The only way God secludes you from all those alternatives is to carry you through the journey of the wilderness. The wilderness experience has three purposes. The first one is to engender trust. Towards God. Trust. Trust towards God. Have you found out any situation in your life where you struggled, struggled, struggled until there was nothing to hold on to anymore? And then suddenly you come to an end of yourself. That's the only time you can look up to God. In order to achieve trust in the wilderness, God carries you through five syllables of experiences or of dealings. The first one is the encounter. The encounter. 
You see, meanwhile, you need to know that the wilderness is a place of separation. Right? You may be in a position where you make up your mind to consciously separate yourself. And circumstances may separate you. Whichever one you stumble into, it is consecration from the world unto the Lord. It is possible to be separated from the world, but not unto the Lord. That's what we have in the church. You know where you find strong believers, they are doing everything in church, but they don't know Jesus and they don't have time for him. They are no longer committing sin, the kind of sin they were committing, but they are not separated unto the Lord. In the wilderness, you are not just separated from the world. You are separated unto the Lord. And the moment you are separated unto the Lord, the first thing you have is an encounter. When encounters begin in your life, know that your consecration is beginning to strike a chord in the realm of the spirit. If you are a Christian and you are, you are not yet having encounters, there's a challenge with consecration. Exodus chapter 3 from verse 1. The Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even unto Horeb. This was the man that ran out of Egypt because he saw the oppression of the people of God and he wanted to use his strength. He is a prince and he is a strong man. So he broke upon an Egyptian and killed him. So he began to wonder how many Egyptians he would have killed before delivering Israel. Even if he was killing them every day. So that was a wrong approach. So God took him out of Egypt. And first of all exposed him to a hopeless circumstance. The prince who lived in the palace was now reduced to carrying ships to the wilderness. You see when he was a prince he had many alternatives. Many options were at his disposal. And if he remained in Egypt, he would still hide within the confines of the authority of a prince. So God took him to the wilderness. And he was a shepherd. So a prince became a shepherd. And he did that for 40 years. You know, if you, you are doing it for one year, you may think, okay, maybe something will happen in Egypt. They may call you. Maybe your mom will take compassion, insist, cry to the king, and you'll say, okay, we are forgiving you, come back. When you do it for, tw- for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years, for 40 years, then the point comes when you know that guy. There's no hope again. You see, when you graduate, you may say you are called into the ministry. You are a full-time preacher. And you are less than 30. So you apply here, apply here, apply here. When you read 30 years, every job you click, they say 26 years below. (laughs) When you get to that point, then you will now fold your certificates and keep them somewhere. That's what happened to Moses here. All his credentials became irrelevant. So he, he had to fold them. It took 40 years for Moses to fold his credentials. And he kept them under the couch. It was at that point that the encounters began. And the Bible said, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire, out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Even though he was separated, God didn't bother about him until he now chose to turn to God. He turned away from the flock and then turned to God. That's where you have to be separated from the activity you are doing. Because that you kept your certificate does not mean you are even choosing God. Because you can be coming to church because you are the one on the microphone. They say, leave prayer. The day they don't say lead prayer, or you plan to come and lead prayer, like as I came now to minister today, and Pastor Tony said, please don't worry, Pastor Shala is here now, so he will preach. Then you know, that is because you are doing it because you, it's a professional thing to you. You have not turned aside to God. That massive crusade, they say you'll be the one to lead the, sem- the song, the choir leader that day, and then you came, they say, don't worry, don't worry, this person will do it. Then you... The whole crusade, you don't care about it anymore. You don't even bother what God wants to do. They should go to her. It's a professional thing you are doing. So, even though Moses' credentials were irrelevant at this time, he was still conscious about the flock until he had to turn away from the flock 
to look at God. And the Bible said, and God said, You see, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. This was the first time everything that was happen, happening to Moses made meaning to him. So you don't know why you finished you are in Lagos. God said, come to Obi. Or come to Makodi. Your friends who are in Lagos are already buying cars. But God said, come to Makodi. And then you have been here for 10 years. Nothing is happening. 15 years, nothing is happening. And then suddenly God said, no, where you are standing is a separated ground. Everything that has been driving you all this why was to achieve separation. They were not natural circumstances. These things were orchestrated from my realm. I was doing this thing so that I can bring you to the center of my will, where your destiny can begin from. Concerning your own life, according to the blueprint that was written before the world began, your life is supposed to begin from the center of my will. So if you were in Lagos, it wouldn't have been possible. If you were in Egypt, it wouldn't have been possible. He said, no, no, no. You have come to the spot now, so put off your shoes. He said, where you are standing is a separated ground. Now we can begin to do business. So the reason you wanted to kill that Egyptian was not because you were angry. The reason you ran from Egypt was not because you were afraid of Pharaoh. The reason you have been leading the ships was not because you were a shepherd. The purpose is to bring you to a holy ground where you are no longer relevant to anybody in the world but me. He said, take off thy sandals. That was the first time all that was happening to Moses made meaning to him. You can live your life for 10 years in the purpose of God. It doesn't make meaning until you have an encounter. The day you have an encounter, you know, apostles say life is not measured by time. It's measured by encounters. It's the day you have encounter that the last 10 years will make meaning to you. If you don't have encounters and you have been following God, sometimes the last 15 years will not make meaning. The last 5 years will not make meaning. The last 7 years will not make meaning. But the day an encounter comes, suddenly, Everything that seemed to be a lost in the past, you now know that it was an orchestration of the spirit in order to achieve a purpose that is bigger than you, but has to find expression through you. See, the place that you are standing, he said, is a holy ground. Next verse. So the first thing that you see in the protocol of encounter of trust, all of these things is to achieve trust. So God begins to give you encounters. If you don't have encounters with God, you may never trust him. You will say it a thousand times, but you will never trust him. Your senses will always speak to you. Your senses will always speak to you. The only thing that shuts down your senses is when you see an encounter. Because in an encounter, first of all, your senses are overwhelmed. So why is the bush burning and it's not consumed? Everything he knew, all his ideologies were shattered down. And God began to speak. So encounter is the first thing that achieves trust towards God. And you only find it when you make the choice of separating yourself. That separation is what we call the wilderness experience. So the wilderness is not a place to suffer. It's a place to achieve trust. Hallelujah. Yeah. The second thing is knowledge. The knowledge of God. You can know about God. You won't trust him. I assure you. Only until you know God. You will never. And you can never trust him. That's why every one of us here know about Jesus. But we cannot do what Jesus asks us to do. And the Bible said in James chapter 1 verse 20. He said thou believest that there is only one God. Thou doest well. He said the devil also believe and even trembles. So the devil actually believes in God more than you. The only difference between you and the devil is your own obedience to God. He opposes the purposes of God. So his belief is not relevant. He said the devil also believes and trembles. You, you believe, you don't even tremble. Have you not seen that time when you are in the presence of God and you cross your leg and you are, I love you, Jesus. <laughs> the devil's belief is not like that. Oh. The moment Jesus shows up, 
They say, Where? Who are you, son of David? Why have you come now? Why have you come? They, they become confused. He trembles. He said, but the difference is your works. So the only time you can trust is when you know the person of God. And the knowledge of God is imparted by God. I will be preaching here. What will touch you is the spirit of the utterance. Not what I'm telling you. I heard apostle for a long time. I didn't even know what he was saying. But I, the more I heard him, the stronger my spirit became. The more resolute I became. The more st- strong and convicted I was about righteousness. Even though I didn't know what the man was talking about. I entered this hall and he was just talking. He said, you are small. And then somebody whispered in his heart, how can you say we are small? He said, ah, there's somebody here. You say, you, he said, you are small. He said, in this game, you cannot lead. You must have to be a, you have to align to one of the participators in the game. If not, you'll be a victim of the intersection of the spirit realm. I said, what is this person talking? <laughs> they come from a place where I know who I am. Because I'm born of God, I overcome the world. You know, we, those were our scriptures. Him that is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. And all things have become new. He said, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses against them. But giving unto them the word of reconciliation. He said, for he made him that was without sin to be seen for us. So that we can become the righteousness of God. Glory to God. I am the righteousness of God. This was our scripture. And then I'm entering the place and somebody say, you are small. What do you mean by that? <laughs> but the more we confess those scriptures the more the devil had authority over us so your brother is confessing that scripture and he's living a crusade but he's going home with a sister the scriptures are on his lips they are not in his heart I heard a man that was speaking to my heart that was when I realized that it is not the knowledge that makes a difference it is the spirit that is communicated in the knowledge if you don't know God, you can't impart God. If you know about God, you raise people that will also talk about God. Only a man that knows God can impart him. And God is known in the atmosphere of encounters. This is the protocol of trust. That's why you are sick, you can't receive your healing. But you know all the scriptures about healing. You have not separated yourself. If you separate yourself, you will receive an encounter. And for the first time, healing will make sense to you. You will receive it as a spiritual substance. All of us are saying the same thing. But the world is not responding. Because very few of us have the person we talk about. And after you have known God, then the next thing is the unveiling of the eternal purpose of God concerning your life. The reason God has to bring you to encounter and to knowledge before he reveals the purpose of your life to you is because the purpose of your life is always bigger than you. You, are not, you can't fulfill it except as God enables you. Any man you see fulfilling purpose is an enabled man. Without enablement, you can never fulfill purpose. So if God reveals it to you, it's a waste. You can't even know where you will fit in. God now said, if you go and confront Pharaoh and release the children of Israel, he has seen their cries. And Moses said, me? Pharaoh? <laughs> How do I, where do I stand in the courts of Pharaoh? I'm not even qualified to stand among the elders. How do I go to release Israel from, do you know what we are talking? Over 3 million people who have been in, the, in bondage for 430 years. And then I go and show up and say, leave them. Imagine if you were the one. Imagine, God now say, go and tell Buhari. <laughs> <laughs> How do you even get to Aso Rock? How do you get to the presidential villa? That one alone is a is crisis already for you. The only way this is possible is if God re- brings you into an atmosphere of an encounter. Because then, for the first time, you will see the essence and the magnitude of the one talking. And then he will also impart himself to you. And then the next thing is that he will cure you of your insufficiencies. Moses saw himself small. 
And God told him, don't worry. My presence will go with you. So the cure to insufficiency is the presence. And you can only interact with the presence in his own atmosphere. That's why many people are Christians for many years, but they don't carry the presence. Because they are not separated unto God. He said, do not worry. My presence will go with you. That's what makes all the difference. That's why Stabara can dare to preach the gospel. Because it's no longer about tongue. A man who don't have the presence is grossly insufficient. And if you know how significant the presence is, you will die in God's presence until he goes with you. That was why when God said, go, my angel will go with you. He said, no. If your presence don't go with us, we will not move. The man knew how insufficient he was. Apostle was teaching us yesterday. And he quoted Philippians 3 verse 3. He said, we are the circumcision that worships God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. So the description of the circumcision is three. He worships in the spirit. He rejoices in Christ Jesus. He has no confidence in the flesh. So if you see a man who is a circumcision and he still has confidence in the flesh, he is not a circumcised person. The proof that you have become the circumcision is that your confidence shifts from yourself unto God. That's why I told you it's not about prayer. I was in God's presence for seven hours before coming for this meeting. And it means nothing if he doesn't come with me. And that's why I'm bold to talk to you as I'm talking. I'm not under pressure to inspire anybody. But if his presence came with me, even if the meeting seemed boring, something will travel with you that you can't deny. The next time you want to be responsible towards God, that thing will fight you. And you, the voice of the Holy Ghost will become louder. When you are alone, you are wasting away on social media. He will summon you and you can't deny it. Because the presence has gone with you. When we started the move of power, before we move in power, we have to. Everywhere has to be. Because if people so don't ascend and you try anything, you are in trouble. Sometimes we look for a song in the spirit. And when we get that song, but the time came when we could sense what God is doing. So as you stand, the Spirit of God draws your attention to somebody and you go there. And as you are approaching the person, he says something. And as you tell the person that thing, something happened. No matter how dry the atmosphere is. But this will only happen when you become decircumcision. You must be separated. Most Christians are not separated. We come to church for activities. When we go home, everything about God ends. That's why God is not in the market. That's why he's not in the government. That's why he's not in the school. We only come to practice it in the church. We don't have him. He said, do not worry. My presence will go with you. If the presence of God doesn't go with you, you can't trust him. Because when you are alone and the challenges of life are screaming at you, the only thing that can make a difference is God. The only thing that can make a difference. And Moses was a wise man. He will go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh will refuse. He will go back to the one that said he will go with him. He will go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh will refuse. He will go back. And even when he left Egypt, you would think his challenge was over. But his challenge was not only Pharaoh. Even the children of Israel he came to save became a plague. They screamed at him. You brought us here to die. How do we cross the Red Sea? And then he looked at the one that said he will go with him. And he said, why do you turn to me? Stretch forth the rod. When you see a man doing signs and wonders, it's because he understands the technology of the presence. It's the presence that makes the difference. For you can only carry the presence if you are separated unto him. That's where responsibility comes to the Christian faith. They beg you to come for prayer meetings. You are a Christian. You are not serious. Though. And the challenges will continue in your family and in your society until you are made into a deliverer. 
Glory to God. And then the last thing is the empowerment. There are four things that engender trust. The first is encounters. The second is the knowledge of God. The third is the addressing of your insufficiencies by the presence. And the fourth is empowerment. In Exodus chapter 4, from verse 1 to 6. He said, what if they don't believe me? (laughs) He said, when you go, tell them I'm the God of your fathers. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He said, put down the staff that you carry. He put it down, it became a serpent. He said, take it by the waist, by the tail. He carried it. He said, in case they don't believe this one, put your hands in your bosom. He put it there, he brought it out, it became leprous. He said, put it back, he put it, he brought it out, it became normal. He said, even if they, if they don't believe this one, take water from the river, pour it on the ground, it will become blood. That's the empowerment. Until you have encounters, you know the Lord, you carry his presence, and you receive empowerment, you can't trust him. That's why you don't struggle with spiritual things. The moment you begin to struggle, you have failed. Go back. In spiritual things, we trust. We trust into manifestation. We don't struggle into manifestation. If you know you can't trust, go back and follow the protocol. This is what the wilderness does for you. It's not a place God organized for you to suffer. God is not interested in you suffering. But in order to qualify to do the biddings of God, you must have to trust him. And it's only in the wilderness, it is only in separation that trust can be born. So that's the first thing the wilderness does, the betting of trust. The second thing is that the call is proven. You see, those five things I gave you was just to, to activate trust. The second thing is that the mandate, the call is proven. See, there are lots of people today, they receive training to become mature Christians, and then the next thing they say, they are apostles. The next thing they say, they are prophets. And they start a ministry and dislocate people from their destinies. <laughs> That's why Apostle said one of the greatest challenges of the church today is dislocation. The guy who should be doing politics and learning how to grow in politics is putting a bishopric addressing himself as a prophet. And then he comes, tell you, marry this one. You go to Lagos. You go to Congo. And people are just scattered. In discipleship, there are two major ladders. The first ladder is to become a, an adult, a mature Christian. That one is for everybody. And that's the call of the fivefold. In Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 11 to verse 16, the Bible enumerated those things there. It said, to some he gave to be apostles, to some he gave to be prophets, to some he gave to be evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. It's not for the perfecting of the apostles. For the work of the ministry, until we all come into the fullness of the knowledge of, of Christ. Unto the fullness of the stature of Christ. So every mature believer is supposed to be like Christ. That you are like Christ does not mean you are sent. That you are seeing visions does not mean you are sent. If God sends you, he gives you a definite mandate. Somebody is sent, is coming to ask you, what do you think we should call this ministry? What? What do you think we should call this ministry? And you are sent? <laughs> it's only Jesus that sent a man. In Mark 3, verse 14, he says he called them to be with him that he might send them. The apostles train you to become a mature believer. God calls you into consecration so that he can send you. In consecration, you are no longer being taught the character of the spirit. You are expected to have received that tutelage from the fivefold ministry. In consecration for sending, God equips you for ministry. In the order of the apostolic, of the prophetic, of the teaching, the evangelist, and the pastoral. And that is why every man who is sent knows his mandate. 
If you don't have a mandate, you are not sent. Don't waste your time. Go back to God and just do ministry. Submit to somebody and grow. They don't know their mandate. And when God gives you a mandate, He gives you a definite location. Because He's sending a lot of people. You can't come to this place and, and say, Remnant, you too, you are called to, 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 for the rebirth of, the, of apostolic. No, that mandate is for Apostle Roman. He gave Moses the mandate and he sent him to Egypt. So, what the wilderness does for you is to confirm and to prove the call upon your life. A man who is not separated cannot be proven. Paul, as mighty as he was, he saw Jesus, but he had to separate himself to the wilderness of Arabia. That was where he received the revelation he had for the body of Christ. Why Peter was an evangelical apostle, addressing cases of sickness, entering territories with the gospel, invading regions with the gospel. Paul was a teaching apostle. He was setting the coordinates for the church. This is how you live your life. This is how you worship God. This is what the church is. This is how the body is to operate. Peter didn't have those capacities. But for Paul to receive that utterance, he had to be separated to the wilderness of Arabia. John the Baptist, before he came, God has already out- I- I- itemized the blueprint of his life. Why does he still need some consecration? Because to know about it is different from knowing it. So John was separated. Luke chapter 1, verse 80. Until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. Jesus himself, the Bible said, as he was baptized. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, he said, he was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he returned in verse 14, the Bible said, he returned in the power of the Spirit. So the call is proven in consecration. Even if you are called a prophet, if you are not yet separated, you can never be a prophet. Because you, you are enthroned from the wilderness. You are not enthroned in the public. You manifest in the public. It is in the wilderness you are enthroned. But most Christians hate it. And then why would darkness not shut the potters? Because only babes are everywhere. There are more than 2,000 prophets. Just talking, talking, talking around, beating around the bush. There are more than 1,000 Christians in political corridors. Nobody can make any change. Because everybody is a babe. There are only few people who can make a mark. What is the call upon your life? And how much separation have you given to yourself in order for that call to be proven? These are simple but basic things. It's not to come and talk about big, big things that you don't even know the meaning. In your daily itinerary, how much time does God have in your everyday life? Where is God in your life? You come to church every day. People are under pressure. Ministers are put under pressure to perform so that people are excited. And people are not becoming anything. Whereas the goal of the faith is transformation. Hallelujah. The last thing in the wilderness is the receipt of the mandate. Is the receipt of the mandate. Is the receipt of the mandate. The Bible said John the Baptist was in the wilderness until the, his day of showing forth unto Israel. And when John came out and they queried him, he said, Why are you doing what you are doing? Who are you? He didn't say anything. He said, are you the Christ? He said, no, I'm not the one. Are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not the one. Who are you then? Why are you doing what you are doing? And John made a statement that struck me. In John chapter 1 verse 33, he said, the one that sent me, he said, the same said unto me, when you baptize on whomsoever the Spirit of God descend and rest, he is the Christ. So he knew that he was the one to unveil the Christ. 
and he knew the technique by which the Christ should be unveiled. That's why he started baptizing. Before John, they sprinkled water on people to cleanse them. That was ceremonial cleanliness. But John's case, he came and immersed the people into water. Even if you are coming from a city, you wash your leg, wash your hand, wash your head and face, and you are cleansed. John was the one immersing people in water. The reason he was doing it was because he wanted to identify the Christ. It's not to do something new in town. That was a mandate. It was specific. Jesus said, the devil cometh not but for to kill, to steal, to destroy. He said, but I am come that you may have life and have it abundantly. I am come. This is why me, I came. Why are you come? And you have been a Christian for 10 years, but you don't know why you are come. I was preaching in Oka, and I told them something. I said, Jesus was a good Christian. A good man. There's no Christianity at that time. He was a good man for 30 years, and nothing happened. But Jesus went into the wilderness as a carpenter, and after 40 days, he returned as light. He didn't just return as, as a man. He returned as light. A, de- a proven deliverer. The Bible said that it may be fulfilled. That which was written by Isaiah the prophet. He said in the land of Zebulun. In the land of Naphtali. By the way of the sea beyond Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles. He said the people that sat in darkness. Have seen a great light. The question is. Was he not living there with them before? What has happened all of a sudden? He had traveled through the wilderness. So the carpenter that went for 40 days came back as a light. Your own consecration may just be for 10 days. It may be for 5 years. The problem is if you defile it, you will never become. And the day of your showing forth to be your worst day. Even the secular people understand this fact. Abraham Lincoln said, I will study and wait. He said, the opportunity will surely come. You prepare yourself. Don't just wake up and say, I'm a doctor because God told me I'm a doctor. You follow the process. Follow the process. These are basic things. They are basic things. But because we don't know these things, that's why our everyday life is littered with activities. But there is little obedience. Apostle said something. He said, as a young Christian, you are full of activity and little obedience. He said, but when you are grown, you are full of obedience and lead to activities. Lead to. Consecration is the key for the making of a deliverer. It is only in the gate of consecration that five of us can appear and God will see five of us as five nations. And suddenly, he say, you are a prophet. You are an orator. You are an ambassador. You are a judge. You are an elder. When we enter through consecration, we come out as refined lights. We don't come out as the same people that entered. We come out as entities in the spirit. But a lot of people are not consecrated. In recent times, whenever I have opportunity to minister here, I try as much as possible not to be charismatic. Because I have discovered that a lot of basic things have eluded us. A lot of basic things. The last time I ministered, I talked about the blood, the utterance of the blood. So that you know what it means to have confidence in God, the utterance of the blood. And a lot of people were walking in guilt because they didn't know the, what the blood has provided for. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, consecration is the key. And in order to achieve consecration, obedience must be an everyday life. Obedience must be an everyday life. You say when your obedience is complete, then you can avenge other disobedience. The thing is not just to stand up and start saying, Flanny die, I'm assuring you. I'm, a, I'm an instructor of church history. I know everything that happened from day one of the church day to day. The head apostles were slaughtered. 
Peter was crucified. Paul was slaughtered. James was thrown from the cliff. Imagine what will happen now if they tell you that they carry one, they slaughter one of the general overseers. You will stand up and say, Kaya, heaven, God will come down. No, ah, they are. <laughs> you have never seen anything. They were killing them until they rose up. And the Bible said, This be the men that turned their world upside down. It was in their evangelical expedition that they conquered Constantine and he made Christianity the religion of the state and Christians experience peace. Because even if God kills one herald, another herald will rise. As you are not discipling, the people that you should win and disciple, that you are not winning and discipling because your witness is not sufficient, are the ones that the devil is winning and discipling. So when you see the disciples of the devil doing exploit, you should know that you are failing. And you may say you are not in the north, you are not in the north. Your next door neighbor drinks. What have you done about it? Everything that is happening, how many times have you rose up to intercede for it? You lie down, you sleep to you throughout the night, and you do that for one month. And then when things happen, you come and say, ah, hey, ah, and you are even praying in church and crying. Who told you your tears can move the mortars? <laughs> the Israelites cried for 400 years. And when God met Moses, he said, I have seen their tears. He said, I'm aware of their oppression. It's not like he was not aware. He was aware. The only way he can do something about it was to raise a deliverer. It's time for the church to rise. It's time for deliverers to rise. And the thing is not about the guy that looks like it. Most times the charismatic people are not the one God uses. Because they are the hardest people to break. The guy believes he knows what to say. The guy believes he looks it. So he will always trust it. But the person that looks as if there is nothing, and he knows that he is defeated, it's easier for that person to trust. And it could just be you. But there is challenge. Our hearts are not even disturbed when we see these things. They say they killed 200 people. Reverend Donato stood here, and he almost, he almost pulled down this building when he was praying on account of the burden that was on his shoulders and some of us were laughing he said he cost the Nigeria team they will not win they will come back and people were laughing there are no bodies things are happening the church is affected it doesn't move you you come to church when they say it you say, and you go home you forget don't you see that you are sick? I sat here when Pastor Tony was preaching. And I said, God bless me with hunger. I said, God bless me with hunger. The reason we can pray for cars and houses is because we are in Benue. But very soon, if you don't rise, Benue will become Afghanistan. And the house you built all your life will be burned down in a second. And then you, that time your prayer will be, God, please, let me see tomorrow. Because next week will not be in view. Irresponsibility. The city that Paul labored in, labored in, the Bible said they took him outside of the gate, stoned him for death. The saints gathered, held their hands, and he rose up. And he entered again and began to pray. That city today is a Muslim nation. Because the likes of Paul were not replicated. If things are happening and you can slumber, what you need is to cry. You know why? Because you are still on earth, but you are no longer relevant to God. You are still alive. You are no longer relevant to God. You need to cry. You need to weep. If somebody has to talk before your heart is broken, there's a problem. A preacher has to do everything, do everything, stir himself, plan the line of his teaching so that somebody can be inspired no I didn't come to 
inspire you. I didn't come to motivate you. I came to show you what you need to do to become. So if you are willing to, you will do it. If you are not willing to, relax. When we meet in heaven, we will not sit in the same place. I read the scripture. God was speaking to Ezekiel. And he said, if I tell a wicked man, you will die. And you don't tell him. He said, I will demand his blood of your hand. What do you mean? Am I part of his wickedness? Some of the things that are happening now, some people will take the blame. Because when God provided them with grace to stand and keep the gates, they were collecting political money. And now they come to speak as fathers, when others have labored to raise altars. They are already guilty while they are alive. He said, but if you tell him, you would have saved yourself. So you may think that man doing what he's doing does not bother you. You are the one God is looking at. You are calling God, but he's calling you. And it's when we get to heaven, we'll know who is calling who. And that's why you may call him from now to tomorrow. Nothing will happen. It's time for us to arise. You need to separate yourself. It's time to seek the face of God. It's time to cry for mercy. My message is not, not the type that comes to cut your heart. It's the type that comes to show you what you must do. And I'm persuaded that what I'm telling you now, the Holy Ghost have told a lot of you. You have just blocked and covered your ears. There are most of you that God have told you to wake up in the night to pray. But for the past six months, you have not rose up once to pray. There are most of you that God have told you specific things to do. But other things have taken possession of your soul. Today is a day to repent and to ask the Lord to bless you with hunger. I tried as much as possible not to be emotional, not to be charismatic. Because I want your will to make the decision. I don't want your emotion stimulated. If you are making a decision, it's because you have judged that everything that you require has been given to you and the Holy Ghost has been troubling your heart. But you have refused. Now you are willing and you are asking for grace. Our day and our world is growing darker. It's an opportunity for us to shine. Will you be amongst the people that God will count on in these last days? Can you bow your head and talk to Jesus? Bow your heads and talk to Jesus. Three years ago, I was sleeping and I, I felt a tap. And as I woke up, I heard, pray for Jonathan. Pray for Jonathan. And I said, Jonathan. I said, Lord, help Jonathan. And I slept. I was grossly irresponsible. Perhaps that would have enlisted me among those who can alter the protocol of leadership in this nation. But because I didn't take that responsibility, it may have been parted on my stature in the spirit. He said, pray for Jonathan. And I could not as much as I was, over, over, I was burdened by sleep. Two years ago, I stood up to pray in July, July 2016, there about. And as I knelt down to pray, I had this burden. I was summoned that night to pray. And I looked at the time. I, I was so tired. As I knelt down to pray, suddenly, my eyes opened. And I saw some beasts like crocodiles, but they stood like men. Coming, they were just appearing on different cliffs and were coming, waging war, waging war. They had these batons in their hands. And I didn't know where my own baton came from. I just had it. And then I started fighting, started fighting. Because I saw people were really contending with them. I didn't even know the people. And one of them came and called me. He said, lead these people to safety. Lead these people to safety. So as I was leading them, people who had money were giving me to keep for them. People were giving me things. And I woke up. And I heard a voice. I have enlisted you among the last days. I mean, you will have a voice to bring people to repentance. From that day, every meeting I went for and preached, people cry. People cry. Even when I'm not preaching, people begin to cry. Their heart is caught. 
he showed me my own part. There are lots of things that heaven have destined for you to enter. But you have been grossly irresponsible. Today is the day of salvation. It's not all the time that your emotions should be stimulated. It's not all the time that you should hear charismatic preaching. Sometimes you should hear things, go back home and check. And check your life again. Check your life again. Check your life again. Because you don't know the, the significance of that instruction. And you don't know the implication of that prayer. You have always felt it's still another of those. Those are the things that make men powerful, mind you. It's not the church you come for every day and all of the activity you carry out. It is this one, this direct bidding between you and the Holy Ghost that makes the difference. And that's what all of us have run away from. That's why the church is weak. Can you pour your heart to Jesus now? Pour your heart to the Lord. Pour your heart to the Lord. Let grace come upon you. Pour your heart to the Lord. Pour your heart. Pour your heart. Ask for mercy. Many people have died because you refused to stand up and pray at that time. Some of the invasions we have now is because our voices, we could not complete the quorum in the spirit. Our voices were not heard. The angels were mobilized in heaven, but we couldn't partner with them on earth. So there was no invasion sufficient to stop that which the devil wanted to do. begin to sing it, there will be a vibration in the spirit. There will be a vibration. Some of you will literally see angelic beings now, now as we are here like this. And some of you will sense touch, touch from God, touch, touch. It will be impartation of grace to stand in the place of prayers. Not, nobody is strong. When you see somebody doing something, it's God enabling him. As we take the song three times, things will begin to happen. There will be vibrations in the spirit. Go ahead, sister. Manta sopra sakabara sakabara.
to my spirit. Most of you here, the personal crisis you've had were supposed to have been addressed in the course of these prayers. Because there was an energy of God that was hovering over your life to bring you into those realities. But the gateway to accessing those things were those instructions given to you. I also received a knowing in my spirit that there's a young man here that the devil have put the fear of death in your soul for a long time. Same as if you are going to die, just feeling as if you are going to die, as if you are going to die. Fear of death. It was to suppress you from breaking into what God wanted to do in your life. The keyboard is play the song now. Only you play the song. You see, the power of God is a tangible thing. It's not something that is not an emotional thing. It's a tangible thing. I ask a transference. I ask for a transference of the power. As it begins to touch, some of you will find yourself crying. Some of you, your hands become heavy, heavy, very heavy. Some of you will be slain. Don't be distracted. hearts. Look upon their hearts, Lord. Look upon their hearts, Lord. As many as are willing and have presented themselves before you, I ask that you begin to touch them. Begin to touch them. Begin to touch them, Lord. Begin to touch them, Lord. Begin to touch them. Begin to touch them. Begin to touch them, Lord. Begin to touch them. Begin to touch them. Begin to touch them. Begin to touch them, Lord. Begin to touch them. Begin to touch them, Lord. Manta sobra sakata kabara sata. Elegebo sabra da babasha bababas. Into sakira barasino. Malekendro marazigdo valagizo zalabata. You find yourself crying, just open up and wave before the Lord. Let there be a flow, a flow into your vessel, a flow, a flow, a flow into your vessel, a flow into your vessel, flow into your vessel, a flow into your vessel. The power of God is already descending. It's already descending. Those who are numbered, those who are numbered, the armies of Zion, the angels are already touching. As the ministers of God who will help the faith of others, those of you who are already receiving, just open up, open up that fountain. Activation, activation, activation. It's a tangible thing. Don't be emotional about it. of God ministering to you ministering to you where's a young man that has the fear of death the fear of death the fear of death prophetic prophetic
covenant keeping God. Yahweh, the covenant keeping God. Oh, 
covenant keeping God. You were covenant keeping God. You were Yahweh, 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 covenant keeping God. You were, you were, you were, you were covenant keeping God. You were, you were. The young man that had the spirit, the fear of death, hovering, spirit of death hovering around him, creating fear. Has he been prayed for? He has been prayed for. The evangelist prayed for him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There are many young people here. Many young people. The Lord has stretched his hand to call you into ministry. Stretch his hand. There are two categories of you I want to pray for. I'm not talking about those who are glamouring for ministry. They are not the one I'm talking about. The Lord has invited you to ministry you know. But you are struggling with fear and the other one outrightly refused. One of them is fear. Fear, if you think of it, fear hits your heart. And then there's another that has outrightly refused. Say, he can't be a preacher. Come, let hands be laid on you now. I'm not talking young people that are shouting, I'm called, I'm called. Fear has attacked your heart. Stay here. You have refused to say, I will not be a preacher. Stay here. prayers be offered. We don't do it by power. It's by the Spirit of God. Today is a day to commission people for, for the kingdom. You are struggling with fear. Stay here. And you, you say you don't want to preach the gospel. Stay by my right. You say you don't the gospel thing. It's not your thing. You don't want to preach the gospel. Is that all? There's somebody here that says he will not preach the gospel. By my right. There are different categories. So that the power of God is an intelligent force. It is tangible. I ask the evangelist Solomon Oka to place hands on you. The kingdom of God needs, it needs men to stand. We come to God for what we can gain. That's why the kingdom is suffering. Reverend sir, can you please so that we are behind time. Mama, can we please? Reverend Tony sir, we are behind schedule. Judge that fear tonight.
a woman here who is in financial indebtedness and you are literally being harassed in case you don't understand me you are owing somebody money and it's literally turning into an embarrassment the Lord asked me to comfort you help is coming from Zion help, help is coming help is coming who is the person so that prayers can be made, help is coming from Zion they are literally being embarrassed being harassed, help is coming from Zion we need empowerment the presence of God is his greatest token for humanity when you begin to interact with God in his realm you will discover that one of the most precious things that spiritual beings crave is the presence of the Lord. And in the very heights of the heavens, sometimes what makes for the stature of an entity in the spirit is where he's standing in God's presence. When Gabriel appeared to Zacharias, he didn't introduce himself as an archangel. He didn't introduce himself as a being of mysteries. The greatest thing that Gabriel had as a possession in the spirit was where he stood before God. And when he introduced himself, he said to Zacharias, he said, I am Gabriel that standeth in the presence. It costs so much for the presence of God to be given to a generation. And so when you come into a service and the presence of God begins to filter into that service, Maturity in the spirit demands that you suspend everything you are doing and internalize it. Because one of the many things the presence of God will do for you is that it will transform you. What makes you become more like God is not how much you really know about God. There are many theologians that know so much about God, but they have no experiential relationship with God. One of the things that makes a man become like God is how much of, of the presence that man carries. And so sometimes when a man enters a place with the presence of God, he doesn't need to talk. The presence of God will begin to, co to command its protocol. And things will happen on their own accord. So one, th one reason we gather like this is so that we can absorb more presence. Because when you go into the world, you will need it. The arguments with men, the crisis of life, the challenges you face... One of the things it comes to do is to cause the presence of God to leak out of your life. And that's why sometimes when you are in, engaged in a serious argument or something affects you so deeply, you find yourself dry. Because it comes to deplete you. And so when we gather together like this, one of the precious things God do for us or does for us is that he releases his presence. And the beautiful thing about the presence is that men don't regulate it. And so sometimes it's when the prayers are going on that the weight of the presence comes into the building. If you are discerning, you will align. Sometimes it's when the worship is going on that the presence is heavy in the building. And so while he was ministering, the presence of God was strong. And I was just weeping. And I knew the service is already blessed because God has visited. The second thing that makes a service worthwhile is the move of God's power. The power of God is what addresses the crisis of men. Man is bedeviled with a lot of crisis. And as I begin to share tonight, you will see. If we took a census here tonight, you will, you will discover that 60 to 70% of the people that came here came with issues that troubled them. So when men come to God's presence or come to a fellowship like this, they are trusting that the power of God will locate them. And to meet them at the point of their needs. Because the power of God will make a difference. As touching your circumstances and the things that surround your life. When the power of God is cast. Men will go through crisis and they will be helpless. So when we gather together like this. We come to make contact with power. Sometimes you can be anointed. But you discover that the issues contending you. They are bigger than what you know and carry. So he said behold how beautiful and pleasant it is. For brethren to dwell together in harmony. Something happens there. There's an anointing. 
that flows from the head through the beard down to the skirt. That anointing comes to address the crisis of man. And so when we come for fellowship meetings like this, we know that the power of God, we address an issue. So when the power of God is present in a meeting, then you are in a, you are in a blessed environment. The third thing that happens to you in a meeting like this is that you receive precision as touching the truth of God. And so the ministry of the word is very important in a service. The ministry of the word is very important in a gathering. No matter how much you feel in a gathering, if you cannot receive a tangible instruction from God, your life will be without direction. Your life will be without help. Because the word of God is the greatest insurance system that God makes available to men. When you find a generation that is struggling, most times it's because there is a scarcity of God's word in their lives. So people sometimes gather together, they are just excited. But the excitement does not translate to definite direction because the word of God does not come in its tangibility and in its specificity. So even though the man comes to God's presence, he goes back and is still confused because what he requires as a weapon of success in life, he doesn't have it. And so one thing we ensure whenever we gather like this is to make sure the word of God comes forth. So the person leading prayers is bringing the word of the Lord by the spirit. The person worshipping is bringing the word of the Lord by the spirit. And when the time comes for the counsel of God to be communicated, the word of God comes with precision. When you come into a service and you receive the word of God with precision, even if you don't feel anything, if you are mature, you know you are blessed. Because that word, you will carry it with you like a weapon. And in the day of crisis, it will come handy. The fourth thing that makes a service a blessing is the love of the Father. When we come into a service like this, we want to experience God's love. Our world is full of bitterness. Our world is full of hate. Our world is full of wickedness and envy. And so many times, the only place of refuge you can run to is that place where you, you come into the warm embrace of the Father. And then you know that no matter how dark and treacherous the world is, there is a place of refuge. There is a place where you are accepted as you are. There is a place where you are helped and you are made to stand. There is a place where you don't meet with condemnation. There is a place where you know and touch the essence of God, which is love. And when you carry that love from that service, you discover that everywhere you go to, you begin to give out the fragrance of that love. When people hurt you, you don't give them hurt in return because you don't have hurt in your spirit. What you have in your spirit is the love of the Father. So you are no longer like a man. You have become like an immortal. You function from his realm. Because most of the times, why we are defeated in life is because we are like what we want to fight. And so when the devil comes to you, he will find something. He will find envy. He will find hatred. He will find wickedness. And no matter how capital letter your tongue sounds, you are still vulnerable. Because when he comes, he will find something that is of his. But when you come into a service and you come into the ambience of God's love, you will discover you will be rid of everything that is of the devil. And you come into your world and pour the fragrances of Abba. And you touch the world, a dying world with the love of God. These things are scarce. You can't find them anywhere. Only in God's presence are they found. Why is it important to share things like this? Because sometimes when we come for a service, we don't even know what to look for. Sometimes when we come for a service, we just want to be excited and go away. We don't even know what to look out for. So many times when the word of God is going on, people are distracted because they didn't come to, they, did, they don't know they came to carry with them words. You came to receive word. You came to receive light. That's what you leave the service with. You didn't come to make friends primarily. You came to pick something that will give you an advantage in the world. You came to mingle with God's presence so that you are transformed. You become a better person. Because when you get to heaven, there will be no register of how many times you went to church. When you get to heaven, there will be no register of how many times you made appearance in the fellowship. But who you become is what the Father is looking out for. And so as we progress in our walk with the Lord, you have to be mindful of these things so that you will know when you are blessed and you will know when you are just excited. So you will know what you carry from a meeting 
and then you can treasure it. Because if you don't know what to take from a meeting, you may leave a meeting and you will lose it even before you get home. Make sure you leave this service today saturated with the presence that you have carried. Don't let anything diffuse it. Because as you leave this meeting, if you are not careful, the first person you call on the phone will choke and diffuse what you carried. And even though you came for a service, you thought it was a powerful service, you didn't, make, you didn't benefit from it. Because the presence of God that you were saturated with, it didn't even last with you for one day. You make a call and you enter into an argument and it, it diffuses away. You may leave this service and you will not catch a word for yourself. You will just look around and be excited. I've become very careful in exciting people. Because I discover I talk to young people. So many times when I'm talking, the moment I start touching mysteries, they start shouting, they start jumping, they start running. But if you check their lives, you can't see the result of the mysteries you're interacting with. Because they don't take words. They just get excited and they're out. No. If we will raise a generation, we must teach them the things that matter. Every week, there should be a word that your spirit have caught. And you have put that word to work. And you have seen results. And then you know that I picked this word from here. I used it. And this is the outcome. And as you keep doing it like that, you can gauge how your life makes progress. You can tell where you were. And you can tell where you are. And you can also tell where you will be. That's why we gather together. And tonight, we thank God for his presence. But the word of God is also coming. And you will receive something. And you will use it. To make your life more beautiful and glorious. In the name of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's not my message by the way. Yeshua. Hamashiach. Lion of Judah, Agune Chemba, Yeshua, Hamashia, Lion of Judah, Agune Chemba. You know, last week we began to look into the word of the Lord, and we said. A generation must rise. And the generation the Lord is looking out for is not a generation of prophets. It's not a generation of teachers. It's not a generation of apostles. It's not a generation of evangelists. It's not a generation of pastors. We said the generation the, world is look, the Lord is looking for is a generation of kings, of priests, and of sons. When a man attains the stature of a son, a king and a priest, the Lord can send him out with the mandate of the kingdom. That man is called an apostle. But is actually a son, a king and a priest carrying the kingdom. When you see a son, a king and a priest carrying the burden of the kingdom, he is called an apostle. When you see a son, a priest and a king speaking for God, he is called a prophet. But primarily... It's not an apostle and a prophet that makes the difference in the kingdom. It's a son, a king, and a prophet. And the reason is because we saw that the stature of the man Jesus in his greatest expression was as a son, a king, and a prophet. And so anybody that attains that height has completed the sequence of growth in the realm of mortals. Because Jesus is the pattern man. Jesus is God's ideal man. And God's standard of measuring men is not by their best abilities. Yesterday you may do something great. God is not going to measure you based on how great you did what you did. God's standard of measuring men is Christ. You may raise the dead yesterday. That's beautiful. You may... Do something mighty in a territory yesterday. That's glorious. But when God wants to measure you, he won't measure you by your best. He won't measure you by your greatest success. When God wants to measure you, he will measure you by Christ. 
because Christ is a standard. And so when the Bible was teaching us through the Apostle Paul in Ephesians from chapter 4 verse 11, he said the reason God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers is not to heal the saints. Will the saints be healed? Yes. The saints will be healed because they are still growing to understand what divine health is. He said the reason he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers is not to bless them and to prophesy over them. He said the reason he gave these offices is to mentor them and to teach them until they come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. And I say when you want to understand the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ, how do you trace it in scripture? It's only at the time when Jesus himself began to veto himself and he asked the question. He said, who do men say I, the son of man, I am? Just in case you want to weigh me in the balances of God, who will you say I am? I know many people who have many opinions and true to his thoughts, they had many opinions because when the apostles began to speak in Matthew chapter 16 from verse 16, they said, some say you are Elias. Some say you are John the Baptist returned from the dead. Some say you are Jeremiah. And others say you are one of the prophets. And Jesus obviously saw that their theological seminary did not have a touch with reality. They read the Torah. They read the writings of Moses. But they didn't have reality. You know, Jesus said, you search the scriptures. He said, for daring you think you have eternal life. He said, but I am the life. You do not come to me to have life. So even though these guys had mastered the Torah, when the most important question was asked, they didn't know who they were looking for. They had read the Torah, but they have not met him. And so having understood that as bogus as the schools of the law that existed were, were but without knowledge, he decided to ask the apostles, at least you have followed me for a while. You should have been delivered from the ignorance of the schools of the law. Who do you say I, the son of man, am? You know, when Jesus meets the crowd, he multiplies fish. And feeds a thousand people when Jesus meets the crowd he brings healing but when he comes do you know that Jesus had to stay with 500 men even though multitudes were coming to him because there are many things you can't discuss with the crowd when he meets the crowd he give healing when he meets the crowd he gives fish but when he came to the disciples you will be shocked that he never organized a healing service with the disciples when you read the whole synoptic Gospels there was never a time when Jesus sat down and taught them word of knowledge. There was never a time when Jesus sat down with them and taught them most of the things that he did with the crowd. When he met them, he was interested in something else. Because when they become the things he gives, they too will become givers. They will no longer be receivers. They will be givers. So the burden in the heart of Jesus was to make them givers. Because Jesus knew that he won't stay on earth for too long. And when he leaves the earth, the crowd will not profit the kingdom. So when he gathers this man, he begins to say the things that really matter. When you are studying the gospel and you want to find out the things that really matter, they are not the things Jesus did with the crowd. They are the things he did with the disciples. And in this context, he was asking them, who do you say I am? Because it's possible for you to walk with me for 10 years and you don't know who I am. But he told a story of a great evangelist. He traveled to India. And this evangelist was the one, his interpreter was the one that drove him to the airport and while they were going to the airport he asked the interpreter for how long have you interpreted for this evangelist the man checked check and said 25 years and he now asked the interpreter he didn't he said himself didn't know why he asked the question but he said are you born again and the man said no <laughs> you are shocked are you born again he said no he said why he said, well, he thought he was just doing his job to help other people. So for 25 years, he led other people to Christ. But he didn't know Jesus. He thought it was a show. When they come into the stadium and people gather and people are shouting, he is interpreting with energy. The man will interpret, he will interpret. The man will speak, he will interpret. But he didn't know that he's, him too is part of those they are talking to. He thought they were talking to the crowd. And he was transferring the message to the crowd. I can assure you that some people can be workers in church. And they will never meet Jesus. And they will walk in church for many years. So Jesus didn't want to take the risk. So he asked the disciples, 
I understand if those out there don't know me, but who do you say I am? And no one knew. Because even Peter, who answered, it was at that moment that heaven opened. <laughs> they had followed Jesus for close to three years. Nobody knew him. When Peter spoke, Jesus said, You don't know this thing. I know, I know that being around doesn't translate to understanding. He said, I know you too don't know. This thing you just said, it was my heavenly, it's my heavenly father who is in heaven that opened your understanding. So this thing came now. That means if Jesus didn't draw his attention to it on the day of resurrection, they wouldn't have known him. Can you imagine the damage that would have been? He said, even you don't know. It's my father who just told you now. But the question or the answer we are looking for tonight is that Peter said, you are the Christ. The son of the living God. It's from this scripture that we understood the full stature of the man Christ. Not the God Christ. You know, Jesus is both man and God. So we are talking about the man context. Since we are not God in the order of Elohim, we need to understand his dimension as a man and walk in it. And so the man Christ sustained the stature as Christ and son of the living God. Now, if you check the word Christ, it's the word Christos. The word Christos was translated from the Hebrew word Mashiach. And the word Mashiach was used 39 times in the Old Testament. And in those 39 times, 37 times, it was translated as the anointed one. It was only twice it was translated as messenger. And so when you trace the Christ, you are talking about a being called the anointed one. So if you want to understand the anointing, you have to go back to the Old Testament to find out who are the anointed people in the Old Testament. You will discover that the word Mashiach was used only when a king is anointed. The word Mashiach is used only when a priest is anointed. And the word Mashiach is used when a prophet is anointed. So when Jesus is called the Christos, if you trace it in its word, in its literal meaning, it's talking about the king, it's talking about the priest, and it's talking about the prophet. So when Peter said, you are the Christ, <laughs> what Peter was saying is that you are the king, you are the priest, you are the son of the living God. And so everybody who comes to the fullness of the stature of Christ will not just be a healer. He will not just be a prophet. He will not just be an apostle. He must also function in the order of the king. He must function in the order of the priest. And he must function in the order of the son of the living God. That's why when he resurrected from the grave, he didn't call them apostles. He said, go and tell the disciples that my father and your father. That means they had come into sonship. In sonship, there's many things they can do. Go and tell them that I'm going to my father and to their father. Because what bothers the heart of Jesus is when he returns to the world, he wants to find kings. He wants to find priests. And he wants to find prophets. You see, man may not understand this. That what the devil is interested in is to ensure that you don't get into the fullness of your reality. When he showed up in the Garden of Eden, he was not bothered about taking away the things that the man had. When the devil showed up in the Garden of Eden, he wanted to truncate the growth process of the man. Because he knows that if he truncates the growth process, the man will always beg for the things that he should command. So when the devil comes, he's not just looking at the things you have. He wants to stop you perpetually from becoming the order of the stature of Christ. And if he can stop you from becoming that, all your life you'll be running in pursuit of the things you should command. And so you may run to a healing service. And when you receive healing, you say, thank you, Jesus. Jesus will receive the thanks. But Jesus' is, Jesus is heart to be grieved. Because Jesus is not just interested in giving you healing. He's wanting, why can't you walk in divine health? There is something better than healing. When you come for a service and we prophesy and a breakthrough happen and you come and say thank you Jesus he will receive the thanks but what he's looking for is why can't you command all things don't you know that all things are yours you can't know those things because your growth process has not been completed 
my brother, Apostle Lawa, works in the miraculous. And many times when we come for a healing meeting, you know that the anointing you came with, for example, I can pray for the sick now and he'll be healed. But you know that what the people need is not just the healing. So many times you will labor to open scriptures, open scriptures. You want to build their faith because you know that they need to walk in this thing. If not, they will keep coming back. That's the body in the heart of Jesus. And the reason is because if man does not grow, the realm where he's living in is too hostile. The things he receives, he will lose them and come back again. And over time, that man will become a slave of things. Whenever he shows up, he will be showing up because he needs something. But God does not want the man to show up because he needs something. That's why before God allowed the man liberty, he gave him everything he needed. So when the man shows up, he's coming for deeper communication. Because there are things and dimensions in God that he wants the man to explore. You know, when you make a new friend, every day you know him better. You know him better. He may give you things, but the idea behind the relationship is for you to explore the dimensions. So what God is looking for in fellowship is to bring us to a point where when we show up, we are not coming to ask God for things. We are looking for secret dimensions in God that is not available so that we will catch it and we will reveal it to our generation. But unfortunately, because men have not grown up, when they come to God, they are distracted by things. They keep asking for things and God is saying, grow up, grow up. Because if you keep receiving things, you will keep needing things. But when you grow to become a, a worker of those things, you will not need those things anymore. And if you think it's a lie, Jesus showed up again in John chapter 10 verse 10. And he began to tell man some secrets. He said, before you came here, there were spirits here. You are not the first creature on earth. There were many spirits here that came before you. That's why I need you to grow into dominion. Because if I give you what I'm giving you, the spirits that are in this realm are older than you. They will take it away from you again. Everything you think you can have when you have it, sometimes those spirits will not even take it from you. They will make you a slave of those things. And those things will become the reason why you may never grow again. So he said in John chapter 10 verse 10, he said, the devil cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. The devil cometh not. What Jesus was revealing to them is not even about the activity of the devil primarily. What Jesus was revealing to them is that where you are, you are not alone. There are other beings where you are. There are other beings that have come to where you are and they are contending with you for ownership of that realm. So you need to first of all understand that you are not alone. There are other spirits here that want to take over what rightly belongs to you. You are not alone here. There are spirits here. And he said those spirits are in different order. He said one of them are the devils. And what the devils do is that they kill. The first thing they want to do is to take away your right in the realm of God. The life that you have. The authority that you have. That's what he's looking for. When he takes it, he will now destroy. And he will now steal from you. He said but not to worry. The devil is not the only person around. He said I too am come. Because I saw that the devil came. You know, the devil came first. He said, because I saw that the devil came, me too, I had to come. That means man's greatest achievement in life is the degree to which he fraternizes with the spirit that controls the realm. Because if he does not know how to fraternize with those spirits, he will become a puppet and a slave in the realm where he's living. Because there are some spirits that came and there's another spirit that has come. The spirits that came are the wicked spirits of this world. But the other spirit that have come is the spirit of Elohim that came to give the man liberty. If this man does not understand that he's in a league of spirits, he will be pursuing things and he will know that those things are the things that the spirit will use to bargain his soul. So what the man should be looking for are not things. What the man should be looking for is intimacy with those spirits to find the right spirit and to fraternize with him. Because it is the depth of his fraternity with that spirit that will determine the advantage that he has in time not the things he has even the greatest thing you have can become a weapon against you if a spirit that is wiser than you takes control that's why people use money today to self-destruct that's why people use cars today to self-destruct i was watching the news two years ago of a popular musician the word they use is blow so he released the song and he he blew <laughs> When he blew, what the spirit whispered into his ear 
is to buy a Lamborghini. And when he bought the Lamborghini, the same spirit that was luring him, lured him into a party. And he went to a club and he drank until 2 a.m. Those of you who are current in that world, you know who I'm talking about. At 2 a.m., he now carried two gears in his car. And the way they were playing the music, the car was shaking like this. And the guy was running on high speed. So what happened is that that thing he was doing was a spiritual algorithm. The spirit was directing his step to destruction. So what happened to the guy was that at about 2.30 a.m., he ran into a ditch. And him and the ladies died. So what the spirit did was that he used the inspiration of a song to produce an album. He used the album to blow the guy. And when he blew the guy, he really blew him. So when you don't know the spirits that control the league, what you call a, call a blessing can become a cause. So what Jesus was teaching them is before you consider things, he said, make fraternities first. The devil came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. You know those things Jesus was saying? If, unless you enter the spirit realm, you don't understand. That he actually gave man a leakage because that's a manifesto. You know, when a politician is, is vying for an office, he gives a manifesto. He will stand like our politicians. Everything they are saying, you know, is a lie. I will, I will bring quality education. Anyone they say, just know it's the opposite. I will make sure light and power is stable. I will bring water. I will ensure security. They are all lies. So, <laughs> when Jesus showed up, he said, my name is ancient of days I was around when the devil made his manifesto you were not there because you are 70 years old you are a baby the realm where we sit we saw the devil and when the devil made his manifesto in the spirit he said my own assignment is to kill, to steal and to destroy so if you are wise don't fraternize with him if you are wise come into a deeper fraternity because before the devil made the manifesto there is somebody called I am the word I am means I was I currently am and I will be so I know the devil and his plans and I know where all his plans will end so when he said I am come it's not English he's speaking what he's actually telling you is that the beginning and the end is here the devil cometh not but for to kill to steal and to destroy but I am has come so when you know what you need to do is to find I am. Is to interact with I am. Because when you interact with I am, you will become a lord over the devil. But if you don't interact with the I am, you will become a slave of the devil. So what God was telling man there, is not that I will bring you provision. He was giving the man a choice. A choice of either becoming a captain over the devil or of becoming a slave of the devil. I am is come to give you an opportunity. Because in I am, you can journey to a place that is older than the devil. Because I am existed before the devil came. I am is existence. So when you come into I am, everything the devil knows, you will know more. Because you will become older than him. You will be in him. And if you become, if you come into I am, where the devil is going to, you will know it. So on the strength of your interaction with I am, you will become older than the oldest. That's why you may look young and they look at you, they say, how old you are you? You are judging by age in time. I am relating with I am. If I'm relating with I am, I've stepped out of time. I've gone to the foundation of reality. That's where we live from. That's what Jesus called life to the full. Life to the full is not to have many things. Because if it's about many things, the Bible will be contradicting itself. He say a man's life does not constitute in the multitude of his possession. So what Jesus was talking about is to come into a place where you become a controller over the affairs of life. So that the devil's intuit we come for nothing. If he likes, he should sum us out. When he finished doing it, you know where he's going to. And you become wiser than the devil. That's the journey of I am. So for you to be able to become a king, a priest, and a prophet, you must interact with the different dimensions of I am. Becoming a king and a prophet is not a willful desire. It's a journey of intimacy. Because when he spoke about life, he wasn't talking about breath. He was talking about interaction. In John 17 verse 3, he said, This is life eternal, that you may know him. So the depth of I am that you know 
is what will determine your level of authority in the natural realm. And Jesus did not make it difficult. He began to break, you know, there are seven dimensions that the Bible revealed to us that grants us access into the knowledge of God. The first dimension is actually the I am dimension. In the I am dimension, the Bible gave us seven tributaries. And I want to talk about one this evening, briefly, before we move. If you study the scriptures, especially in the book of John, there were seven times Jesus used I am. The first time he said I am, he said I am the resurrection and the life. That's why when he said I am come, he said you will have life to the full because I am is resurrection and life. The second time he used I am, he said I am the bread of life. The third time he used I am, he said I am the door. The fourth time he used I am, he said I am. Who follows me? Who is following me? Who is following me? I am the way, the truth, and the life. The fifth time he used I am. What did he say? He said, I am the good shepherd. The sixth time he used I am. He said, I am divine. I am divine. What Jesus was trying to reveal to us is that you don't just know me on the street. For you to know me, there are channels you need to enter. It's either you come in through life and resurrection, or you come in through the door, or you come in through the way. And the seventh time he said, I am the light of the world. Or you come in through the light. If you don't find Christ through any of this access way, you will be a slave of the devil. And so the journey of man on the earth is to find different channels into I am. Kingdom pursuit is not things. Is how many dimensions of I am you have found. For some of you, you will find light. And when you find light, everything the devil is doing is open to you. You can read his move like a book. And that light will become direction. That light will become strength. When those things begin to happen to you, it means you are beginning to grow into the stature of Christ. Because Jesus himself revealed to us how we can find him. He said, one of the ways you can find me is to find light. He said, the second way you can find me is to eat the bread. If you find the bread that came from heaven, you will find me. He said, the third way you can find me is to drink of the vine. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He said, the fourth way you can find me is to be granted access. That's what we call revelations and encounter. A door opens to you and you come in. You didn't read it, but you know it. He said, the fifth way you can find me is to come in. Because I'm a teacher. I will open your heart and I will teach you my oracles. When you begin to enter these doors, it means you are growing. So one thing we do when we gather together like this is to explore the many dimensions of I am. And when you begin to explore it, you will discover that something begins to happen to you. The things that happen to you are no longer earthly. You can just lie down in your room and because you have met I am, it begins to educate you from within. You will now realize that the Christian life is heavier inside than it's outside. When your Christianity is heavier outside, you have not met him. Because when you meet him, your heart will become a school. Many activities will be going on at the same time. And you are one, people will wonder, what is going on here? You are in another world. Because you must be taught in that world before you can colonize this world. But if you learn from this world, you will be part of the problem. Acting as if you are a solution. You can't bring solution until you enter into it. If you don't go through that door, if that light does not appear to you, if you don't eat of that bread, if you don't make contact with the resurrection, there is no way you can make change in your life. So when Christians are no longer pursuing I am come, when Christians are not joining into I am come, they are not making progress. Everything they have can become the reason for their misfortune. And so I am was one of the channels Jesus revealed to the world of finding him. Let's consider I am life. This evening quickly because we don't have so much time. I am the resurrection and the life. It's one of the dimensions of knowing Jesus. You see, when you come to Christ, one thing he wants to do, one encounter he will give you is that he will give you life. But the thing with the encounter of life is that you don't feel it. Because life is a journey. When I am wants to bring you to his realm and to his stature, one of the encounters he gives you is life. When he gives you the encounter of life, what will happen is that you will grow in it. And as you grow in it, you will discover 
a point will come when when men look at you they will know that you are functioning from another realm they will know that you are functioning by another inst another resource they will know that you are communicating from another dimension so the journey of christianity is encounters with i am and one of the encounters is the encounter of life when a man has the encounter of life the first thing that happens to him is what we call a knowing a knowing i'm showing you a dimension of christianity that is not on the buffet i'm showing you a dimension of christianity that requires solitude i'm showing you a dimension of christianity that requires responsibility i'm showing you why there is so much activity but there are many babes because we don't know the organics we know the common we know the trending we know the popular if i call for a healing service now i can begin to walk healing from the beginning but you'll be shocked that many people will go back they will fall sick again and they will never grow all the people jesus healed were sinners all the people he rose from the dead they died again but there were other people that by the bible never recorded that jesus healed there were other people the bible never recorded that jesus prophesied over but suddenly those ones when jesus left they showed up and when men looked at them they said ah they took note that these ones have been with christ he never healed them but there is another thing he taught them that's why he took them to the mountain it was a school of life i know that when i come down to the valley i say be healed everybody in the city will be healed but encounters of life is not by a declaration it's a journey encounters of life is not by a commandment the bible said when the evening was come in matthew chapter 8 verse 16 they brought all that were sick to him and he said that they may touch him and he said virtue went out of him and healed them all that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by isaiah the prophet the land of the land of zebulun the land of naphtali he said they that were in darkness have seen great light he healed them all but when he wanted to bring the encounters of life he took them to the mountain for three days because in the encounters of life it's a syllable is a protocol it will keep unveiling many times our christianity becomes too distracting that we no longer pay attention to the encounters of life because when it comes into your spirit it will become a law over your soul it will draw your attention it will require your focus and your commitment but too many times we don't develop it so we are big on the outside but when you check us inside we are so small we cannot sense when a signal is activated meanwhile that signal that is activated may be a summon to high quarters because life is speaking you know there is not only the holy ghost that is on your inside talking even life itself has a voice life has an utterance that's why when a child is born they, you, do, you don't hear any transmission the child knows hunger hunger will communicate to the child and the child begins to look for what to eat and you are wondering how did you know that food passes through the mouth there's an educational syllable the mom doesn't teach the side that you eat from the mouth hope you know that when the child was in the pregnancy in the womb the child was eating by umbilical cord the child never ate with the mouth but the day the child came out all of a sudden he begins to look for things to put in the mouth who taught the child that you eat from the mouth because life itself is an educational syllable life itself it will train you it will teach you but when your christianity is full of distraction you will not learn the whispers of life so when life is talking you will be running and doing things that's why after many years you will not grow because if that child does not learn how to eat that child will die after one week when you encounter the life the life becomes a teaching the life becomes a training the life becomes a way it will educate you and the teachings of life are silent because it doesn't want any other person to hear it is specific to you as you are sitting here now if you are pressed nobody will know life will speak to you in the most silent fashion because it's an organic communication but if you don't go out to ease yourself you will become most uncomfortable and the next person sitting by your side will be wondering why are you so uncomfortable i'm hearing something very loud but you can't hear it even if you are my best friend it will be so loud that you can't sit down anymore but the next person can't hear it because they are inaudible utterances they are intangible communication but the impact can kill the impact can awaken that's how god raises men through life he brings them into a syllable when a man makes an encounter with life the first thing that happens is a knowing it's a knowing you need to understand all your spiritual faculties and you need to understand how they speak to you when hunger comes it's different from when you are pressed the responses are different when you function like that you are not a man of activity you are an organic man 
And that's how spiritual life also is. You need to know when there is danger, you pick it here. And as you pick it, you leave. People don't know why. It's not word of knowledge. It's not the Holy Ghost that spoke to you. It's an inaudible utterance that proceeds from life. But if you don't get there, you can't be like the Christ. You can never be like the Christ. That life will speak to you sometimes. When you say the wrong thing, you lose your peace. And then somebody else is saying, what happened? You say, I can't sleep. Why? I spoke against this brother. And then, the, uh, uh, I beg, forget. Is it? Is the weight of life that you carry. Another person can speak against a brother and he's smiling. It's a normal thing. He feels okay. But you, that you join that conversation, you will now lose your peace. And then you go to God and you are apologizing. And the people are wondering, what did you do? You say, I'm sorry. I spoke against my brother. You are in two different realms. One is functioning by life. The other one is a religious man. He doesn't know where you are. It's an economy that works in the Christ. The way Jesus lived his life is by functioning by the motions of life. It was so strong in him that sometimes when Jesus is even traveling, life will restrain him. You will hear that Jesus must go through Samaria. The Holy Ghost didn't talk, but life is governing the direction that he will go. If you want to grow in this kingdom, you must begin to function by the sensitivities of life. There are many things that life is telling you that you didn't hear. Imagine if you were a child and you were born, you didn't eat for one week. You didn't eat for one month. Imagine if you, at your level of maturity now, you don't ease yourself for one week. It will be something that will require intensive care. Be why that's how most of us are in the spirit. Activities cannot replace life. The operations of life, they are embedded in you. When life comes, there's a protocol. The first protocol is in knowing. That's why Jesus said, this is life eternal. That you may know. That you may know. That you may know. And many times when people don't know, God now sends messengers to tell them. Because if they are not taught and brought into that awareness, they can't grow. I'm assuring you, you can give all your money. You can give all your possession. You will think you are pleasing God by giving. And because you are happy about it, you will give until you will give your all, but you will not grow. And then you are wondering. Because even the feedback system of the spirit, you have not been told to pay attention to it. So when you went to give, you left and God now spoke. Your answer came, but you don't know how it works. And then you are waiting for external things. Our spirituality is not all external. The deeper part of our Christianity is internal. But unfortunately, many believers have negated the internal dimension. That's why even though they are walking, they are not alive. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, it said when you receive Jesus, it was not a religious activity. When you receive Jesus, he said you had an encounter with life. So he began to tell them. He said, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know. That you may know. Life will insist that you know that you have eternal life. It's written to you. Since you cannot pick the frequency, God sends men to remind you that the heaviest part of you is not external. I know you can talk loud. I know you can pray. But there is something at work on your inside that you are not paying attention to. Many times God speaks to you from inside much more than he speaks from outside. How come you are used to the external but you can't pick the internal? He said you can't grow. So these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. So when a man receives Jesus, he's not coming to learn how life works. It's already there. All you need to do is to draw his attention to it. This is where his victory begins from. When a man knows that there's something at work on his inside, Next time he wakes up and he hears a song, he will drop his phone and start singing that song. Because he knows that song is not coming because he heard somebody sing it. He knows that song is life giving amplification to an organic thing happening on the inside. That is not church activity. That is operation of the spirit within you. Life is at work. Sometimes you wake up and you want to eat. And then it looks as if eating is a sin. You are very hungry. But you know that life is placing a demand. And the moment you know now that there's life, you will keep the food aside and you begin to walk around. You want to find out, what is life saying that I don't know? What is it saying? It's because sometimes the whisper is very faint. So you need, to, you need to pay attention. And so sometimes you quickly step out of the room and then you go somewhere early in the morning and then people are wondering, is he mad? You know, these things can become so strong that sometimes while you are walking alone, you are walking like this. And somebody is looking at you and say, Jesus, what's happening to him? 
you, you are trying to connect to a frequency. There's an alignment pattern. There's an alignment pattern. The whispers are too faint. Anything can, can break that frequency. And because you don't want it to go, you, you are following it carefully. And after a while, it will become louder. It will become louder. You will now hear that. Take a fast for three days. That three days is your safety. Sometimes the bottle of oil they poured on your head can't save you. Because your safety is in a discernment that must be activated. And life have checked that you are rusty. So he said, take a three days fast. Because on the third day, which is the evil day, I need you to pick the frequency. And when you take that fast, maybe you woke up on the third day. And you stepped out of your house. You want to open your car. He said, no, not car today. Your car will be packed. You will take an Uber. People can't understand. That's when you become like the wind that blow it. He said, thou listest not from whence it cometh or where it goeth. He says, so are they that are born by the Spirit. It's an organic protocol. When Jesus said, whoever is born of God overcometh the world, he wasn't telling us a parable. He was telling us things that happen to men when they grow. When men grow, they become invincible. Because that life is so personal. Even if the devil put his ear on your chest, he can't pick those vibrations. Because it's networking to you. And so the devil will be around. But his presence will not matter. That's why I said even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We will fear no evil. There is something happening in us. He said the light is the light of man. And he said the light shines in the darkness. The darkness can't comprehend it. He can't understand. Because it's an intangible language. You are wondering how did they know that we were waiting here? Life spoke. And the man mastered it. He paid attention to it many times. Sometimes when life discovers that your ear in the spirit is rusty, it will tell you to go on a 40 days fast. It's not religion. Forget, you can fast with your church in January. That's beautiful. It's corporate exercise. But if you want to grow, you need more than 21 days January fast. You need, sometimes it will take 90 days. Because God wants to promote you. But the place is promoting you. There are hyenas there. Hyenas that want to eat you up. So life will have to prepare you first. And then it tells you, for 90 days, take a fast. Sometimes you want to sleep, and life will wake you up. You can't sleep now. You can't sleep. That's why my friend was preaching. He said, the times when kings go to war, they, these are intangible alarms. It's so loud, but your neighbor can't hear it. If those knowings don't happen, your Christianity is fake. Not because you want to be fake, but everything you do, it will look spiritual, but it will have no root in the realm where it matters. When you want to see a true believer, he functions by the motions of life. Whatever he offers must come to pass. Because those things, they came from the realms of the I am. When the courts alter their oracles, it beams into you through the light. That's why he puts it in you. So that you can hear things that me, ordinary men can hear. It's a product of intimacy. It's a product of fraternity. Too many Christians are dead on the inside. They can't pick the signals. We are many, but we are weak because we don't know life. It begins with a knowing. Some of you, as you hear these words, you will discover that that engine on your inside that was rusty is beginning to shake. And when you leave this service, life will now tell you this night, pray it in morning. Something has started. And then in the night, you are walking in your room, you are praying. You are praying. And then you think the prayer ends in the morning. It doesn't end in the morning. When the morning comes, he will now tell you this week, read the book of John. And then you are wondering, why do I need to read the book of John? He is looking for how to energize your spirit. You have been rusty. You didn't exercise for long. Those days when we were younger, we will go to the field sometimes once in a month. And then you that ran to run around the field ten times. You now run for five minutes. You are pretty. <laughs> As if you want to die. It's been long. The vents have become stiff. The flexibility is no longer there. So when life wants to drill you, the encounters take a while. He will drill you until you come, you become flexible. And so when you become flexible, even if a whisper pass, you can pick it. And then you say, ah, oh, I just saw an angel. And somebody look at you and say, ah, ah, is that how easy it is to see angels? You are walking in different dimension. But when we become mature, that day will come. When everybody will know the frequency. If you pick a wrong song, everybody will know that you are in the flesh. You will be jumping. Hey, hey, everybody look, look, see what people look at you like. This. You are in the flesh. Just step aside, step aside. Because, you know, life hates death. So when you do things of the flesh, it will be irritated. 
you are singing a gospel song, people are irritated. And you are saying, Is it not Jesus I'm glorifying? You are, it's your flesh you are glorifying. You want to dance because you think it's a show. So you come, you do like this, you do like this. This is not a show. Life will resist you. And when you are functioning in the flesh, everybody will look at you and say, Get out. And suddenly you move, somebody else comes. And that person is singing a song. They don't know the song, but life is communicating with life. That's Christianity. Until we come there, we are not strong. We can't fight the battles of the age. And so the encounter every believer must have is the encounter of life. This one is not taught in the Bible school. It's a journey with the Holy Ghost. He will strengthen it from the inside. When knowing comes, then maturity has begun. The journey of life. This is why Christianity in Africa is weak. You know, when Pastor Victor was praying, some people started praying. They thought it was five minutes. Oh, boy. When the prayer reached 15 minutes, they discovered life is not enough. When the prayer reached 30 minutes, some people advised themselves and sat down and began to do like this. But if you know how life works, that point where you are weak, that's when you are beginning to touch the engine. It's no longer about how long they want to pray. Something is dying here. I want to resurrect it. So even though you don't feel like it, you now discover we walk by faith, not by sight. You are stirring something. And if you activate that thing, you will sense ventilation. Encounter with I am. It's an encounter with life. Some of you have life, but that life is dead. Because you don't know how long. You don't know when you touched it. You don't know. You have activated your emotion. Your emotion is too strong. When they sing a song, you know you are jumping like this. When they change the song, you become like this. Because it's emotion you are working with. Life is not being touched. But when the Holy Ghost wants to help you, He will bring you back to the corridor of life. And for some of you, for life to be stirred, it will take many days of fasting. That kind of fasting now, you don't count days. You count moments. The time when life was touched. A point come when the Holy Ghost brings you diagnosis of prayer. And then he tells you, pray for four hours every day. The first two weeks, you will sleep throughout. But you can't stop. Because it's not about one week. It's not about two weeks. There is something dying that he wants to resurrect. When you don't stop, maybe after one month, you now go to pray and you, you just sense an energy from inside. You now know, oh, that's when the prayer began. The other ones were exercised. Life is about to cook in. And when it's cooking, you now begin to pray into realms. You now discover prayer is not just loud tongues. Prayer is about bettings. Is there as soon as Zion travel? She brought forth her children. You now discover prayer is about journeying. Journeying. You can be in your room and you will travel to North Africa. And then when you come back, you will tell the nations what God is saying. It's from the economy of life. Too many Christians are not alive. Too many. Hallelujah! Hallelujah!
You can be an apostle, but you are dead on the inside. Benihim told the story of a rabbi in Israel. This lady was demonized. They took her everywhere. Everybody prayed for her. Prophets, apostles prayed for her. Nothing happened. But where they lived in Israel, because they are a wealthy family, at the foot of the rock, there was a rabbi that is always indoors. Every time you are passing, as they are passing to go up, the man is citing the Torah. He's reading the Torah and he's prophesying and he's speaking in tongues. They say this man is a noise speaker. What kind of man is this? When they tried everybody and Christians were not producing results, they now went to imams. Imams too could not produce results. They now said, let's try this man who is always disturbing us at the foot of the rock. And they went and told the man, our daughter is demonized. We don't know. We've done everything. The man now said, go, I'm coming. And two hours later, the man came out of his house and he began to climb the mountain. And he was just talking. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. As the man was ascending the rock, the demons began to leave the gear in the house. The moment the man came to the door and opened the door, the lady was delivered. There was no need for prayer. He came with energy. He came with a realm. He came with a dimension. Why do you think we preach and our world is not changing? We are talking things that we read. We are mental, but the weight of life is light. That's why one man can be addressing 5,000 people, but the city can't feel it because it's from head to head. The day it becomes spirit to spirit, you will find men that will turn their worlds upside down because you don't necessarily need a long sermon. You need weights of glory. But for that to happen, yourself must be cooked and incubated in the chambers of life. There is a knowledge that is scarce among mortals. And so Jesus came to bring us that knowledge. So the idea is not breath. It's so that you can travel back to the conclave where possibilities that are not captured where mortals dwell rest and when you come with those possibilities even if you say Jesus is Lord your territory will feel the vibration that's what we call the statue of the Christos he carried too much life when Jesus came down from the mountain the moment he entered the synagogue demons began to cry leave us alone leave us alone why have you come before your time because of life because of life but we don't have it we have the theological one the organic one is weak because the organic one will disciple you the organic one will take you through a process many times that life will stop you from sleeping if you know that growth is not just about church service you will pay attention because it may take 30 days of, of being awake at night for that life to be energized you may come to church for five years but they may not touch those cords. Some of you will come here. I will not be able to touch your cord. But when you live here. The Holy Ghost will now give you an instruction. And as you follow. You will discover. You will receive things in your bedroom. That you could not receive on the crusade ground. It's a knowing. It begins with a knowing. Please sit down. This knowing has three layers. The first layer. Is consciousness. This is where you move from theology to organic experience. See, when this consciousness comes, you will just know that if I touch that cancer, that cancer will go. You are not coming reciting scripture. There is a place where you are coming and you are quoting scriptures because you are hoping one will walk. There is another place where the scriptures have become a part of you. Because you have walked and interacted with this thing until it has become your consciousness. So when you come, you know if only I touch, things will happen. When you have entered that level, you know you have begun to grow in life. It's a consciousness. That's the consciousness the psalmist had. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Many people are coming to church, but they have their own consciousness. Do you know that there are many believers here who, who know they who believe they can be cursed? I know you have not told yourself, but anytime you say you want to curse another believer, 
is because you have a consciousness that a believer can be cursed. And because you have that consciousness, even you can be cursed. Do you know there are many believers that think evil will happen to them? A wrong consciousness. They have not interacted with life enough. That's why before he announced life, he talked about death. He talked about destruction. Because when life comes, he rules over death. He rules over destruction. He rules over things taken away. When you, when you think evil of another believer, it's because you think it's possible for evil to happen to a believer. But if you have entered a consciousness where you know that evil can happen to a believer, you can't think evil of another believer. When you enter a consciousness level where you know that a believer cannot be caused, you can't cause another believer. The reason why we do a lot of religion but we don't have manifestation is because our consciousness is wrong. And our consciousness is wrong because we have not fine-tuned to the Christ. When you fine-tune to the Christ, a point comes, you will know that anything that can happen to Jesus can happen to you. This is not theology. This is not religion. It's a reality. That's what life comes to do to you. That's why Paul said, if you say that you are born again, if you believe that your life is hid in Christ and in God, it's a let your consciousness, let your affection be only on the things above. Most times we are saying one thing, our consciousness is saying another thing. The reason is because we've not interacted with life enough. That's why John said, I'm writing to you that you will know. Paul was saying the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5 17. He said, Whoever is in Christ Jesus, he said, He's a new creature. He said, All things are passed away. He now said, Behold. The key word is behold, it means become aware that every other thing. Is of God. So anything that is not of God can't happen to you. When you come to that level, you are beginning to join into dominion. Nothing man does that moves you. There's too much assurance in your spirit because life has been trained. There are too many believers waiting to hear something positive before they are excited. When they hear something positive, they are jumping up and down. When they hear something negative, I travel a lot. Sometimes I want to travel for a great meeting. I will now see myself in a coffin. I'm in a coffin. They are going to bury me. And then the me in the dream is afraid. When I wake up, I say, well, since I saw it, I'm not the one. I don't pray about it. They know. I don't pray about it. If I'm not to go for that journey, we know. I don't need to see a lying vision. I know. You can't manipulate me. I've been in places, people come, see all kinds of things. Hey, they saw you, you died. <laughs> we don't die. <laughs> you don't know what I heard in the last eight months. But there's too much life. I can't even be worried. Sometimes when they say things and they tell me I laugh, I say it's because we are making impact. Five years ago, when I was not making impact, nobody spoke about me. If people have the time to speak about me, it means I'm making impact. Glory to God. But the thoughts of man can't come to pass. The desires of the evil cannot come to pass because there's something in your, in your life. You are rooted in life. Too rooted for anything to happen to you. It begins with consciousness. When we tell people to meditate on scripture, it's not to know scriptures and quote. Is so that they can grow in the spirit. You become one with it. That's the idea. When we tell men to pray, the goal is not to say, I cancel 10 hours. That's for babes. When you have grown, you know that as soon as Zion travel, she brought forth. It's the bettings of prayer you are looking for. You can pray into a place. You can pray into a dimension. You journey by prayer. And when you get there, even 10 hours is too small. Because sometimes you travel too far. You can't come back that day. And then you are just on the floor in your room sobbing. You went too far. You go to certain places in prayer. And then you begin to interact with celestial things. Your body literally begins to burn. You can feel the heat so much. It's as if your hand is on the stove. And while you are unconscious praying, you are crying. Because you have gone too far. You are, you are no longer in control. Your hand is burning. 
you are you are you are hoping and begging that they will withdraw the intensity a bit because you are you are becoming something else it's the journey of life it takes consciousness to travel but too many believers don't have these experiences because they don't know what to focus on it's not about activity most times workers in church become the most carnal. they never hear the word of god they think it's just about doing things if you don't grow what you are doing will be a waste because the point will come you will do it for flesh these things i'm telling you nothing can replace it you may know a lot of principles but you may still be a babe in the realm where it matters because everything you are doing is from your head you can't move here but god is looking for the man that flows from the river of life i told pastor victor i said from monday it's not announced but we'll be praying here for three hours straight no prayer point when you stand pray for one hour straight let something let something affect you a little until something is quickened we are too strong in the flesh hey. when you grow in consciousness then life will take you to another level it's called engagement all of that is still under knowing engagement it is an engagement that you begin to test your muscles sometimes you are walking and then you are at the airport and then you see somebody on the wheelchair and then life will now move you say pray for her <laughs> you will look around pray for who here Christianity is not on the pulpit. It's not on the pulpit. Forget this grace of a wearing suit and preaching on the pulpit. If you have not traveled in the corridor of life and you come here, you will bring reproach to the name of the Lord. Sometimes you come to work and life will move you. Say, talk to your boss. Even you, you will know you want to faint. But it is in that engagement that you are strengthened. And I assure you, when you begin engagement, you will fail many times. That failure is to build conviction. Not because what you are doing is not working. But if it works the first time you did it, you will think you are a champion. You will lose the lesson. So many times when you try it, you will fail. You will try it, you will fail. But life won't let you rest. The last time you went to speak to a lady, she embarrassed you publicly. Life will still drag you to talk to more. The last time you prayed for the sick, you carried her up. She fell down. They almost beat you. Life will still move you. You will do it until a point come. The idea will no longer be manifestation. It will become who you are. So manifestations no longer move you. When it becomes who you are, manifestation becomes the byproduct. Life will take you from consciousness to engagement. I'm showing you. See, Christianity in our generation now is to gather in auditoriums. Those of you who have been believers for the past 15 years, you know that in those days when you gave your heart to Christ it was about soul winning it was about going out and praying for the sick you went house to house but I assure you now we are looking for the conferences where the big preachers are coming that's why we are applauding men but we are not growing because we don't give life enough ventilation if you give life ventilation it will first of all set you up before it delivers you you traveled with life when they say i am come he was bringing you into a realm sometimes life will move you to talk to your father this thing you are doing is wrong and jesus said i should tell you your father will look at you like this <laughs> you will go back and cry lord why and god will keep quiet you are in a school. This one is harder than church service. It's deeper than a message. It's an organic process. The man that everybody dreads. Life will tell you, go and confront him. And tell him if he doesn't repent, he will die. 
Sometimes you will need three days fasting and prayer to be able to generate enough life to take that step. But that's how you grow. You journey from consciousness to engagement. When you engage for a while, then you enter mastery. It's when you enter mastery that you have liberty of flexibility. You know, the first time I saw Benihim remove his suit and threw at people, they fell down. I went for a crusade. When I heard that the people were praying loud, I now say, there's energy in this hall now. I removed my suit. When I hit it on the person, he held it like this and gave me back. You don't do what Benihim is doing. You travel until you get there. When you get there, life will give you your own flair. Because mastery comes with dimensions. Dimensions. You may not need to. There's a man called Andres Bisoni. He is of the offsprings of Benihim and people like Carlos and Carlos and Akondia. He drank from them, he drew from them until now when he comes for a meeting. When he's done, preaches everybody stand up, they gather. If he does like this, the whole people will fall down. He didn't need to do what Benihim was doing. As he journeyed in life, he entered mastery. And when he entered mastery, his own flair came out. So that the glory of God, you can see different dimensions of it. If all of us begin to copy Benihim, we will limit Jesus Christ. But the only way we can give Jesus access is when we grow in life. You will leave this meeting today and some of you will go back and begin to pay attention to the impulses of life. That's the deepest aspect of your Christianity. The deepest aspect of your Christianity is not what you are doing in church. It's not even what you felt. What you felt may leave after the meeting. But when you begin to master those impulses of the spirit, sometimes you will grow in it until it will break as a song. My friend Dunsin was a bass guitarist. But he grew in life until a point came, a voice broke out. And when he sings, you will know this is not a psalmist, this is a priest. Because what is coming out is the river that flows from the throne. When he's ministering, you can literally see the sea of glass because he's piping the dimensions of heaven. It will be a waste for you to look at somebody and want to copy. There's no room for copying in this world. This realm where we are, there's more than enough. We are interacting with El Shaddai. But if you have not journeyed in life, you will take the option of copying people. And when you copy, even if you are best, you'll be second best. And God will not need you because he already has one of that order. There is something that God has planted in you that it will take life to get there. When you begin to travel on this path, Christianity has begun for you. The first ordinance of life is in knowledge. That knowledge is consciousness. That knowledge leads to engagement. And that knowledge leads to mastery. The second ordinance of life is yieldedness. This life does not just come to make you manifest. It's a government. Ah! Wait. Time is gone. Time is gone. Oh, Jesus. I wanted to, and this way I wanted to ascend. Time is gone. You know, when you are dealing with life, the first thing it does is that it woos you. It will show you things. You will now come to a place. He will tell you, this cripple will walk. And then your pursuit will be, let cripples walk. Let cripples. You are praying, you are fasting for one year. Oh, 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 when it comes, it will put a law over you. That law is what we call consecration. Consecration is not rules and regulation. Rules and regulation are necessary when you are beginning to guide yourself until you tap into life. When you come into life, you will now begin to touch the true tenets of consecration. The true tenets of consecration is inside. It flows from inside out. Discipline is from outside in. Consecration is from inside out. That's why he said, because thou lovest righteousness and hated iniquity. It wasn't something he was trying to do. He had built something on the inside that hates him. That's what causes him to align with God. So when life begins to grow in you, that life will teach you the way of consecration. It will bind you. It will keep you under severe government. And the way he does it is twofold. Number one is through hunger. 
when truly life begins to grow in you, you will discover that there is an uncontrollable and irresistible pull towards God. That's why I say, draw us and we will come after you. Draw us. We are not pursuing you because somebody told us to. We are being pulled towards you. Life will draw you so much. And the more a man stays in God's presence, the more the propensities of the flesh are mortified. So what we call consecration is actually a love engagement that makes you hate every other and desires only him. It is life that will bring you to true consecration. When you come to a place where they reduce consecration to laws and discipline, people will drift into secret sin. So you will, call, you will, see, you will come to church and act all pious. But when you go out, you know you are dying of lust. You know you are dying of masturbation. Because you didn't give life access. Life is actually the cure to your quagmire. But you first of all have to allow it grow until it becomes strong to dominate you. When life dominates you, the only thing that will be in your spirit will be hunger. A thirst for God. Even when the church is not fasting, you'll be fasting. And then you'll be shocked that one man will fast more than the whole church. That's why Paul said, I pray in tongue more than ye all. How can one man pray more than the church? It's hunger. Because he's not praying according to church calendar. He's praying according to the laws of life that suppressed him. So he has come under a government. These are the dimensions of true Christianity that is no longer found. That's why we have too many fake men. We were not taught that Christianity is not about church. We were not taught that Christianity is not just about gathering. We were not taught that Christianity is not about title and place in church. So we deceive people to pursue after places. I am the choir director. I am prophet this. I am apostle this. But this prophet, apostle, this choir director, this, this media head does not have a relationship with God. He doesn't know when hunger woke him up from sleep to pray. He doesn't know when hunger made him forget about dinner and he was with God. He doesn't know when hunger drove him to a secret place and he prayed there until it became too late to come home. Because it's not about relationship. We don't know true consecration. And every time consecration is not in place, a lot of things will go wrong. But when true consecration begins, it is the laws of life that binds you. The second way he does it is by a burden. In Mark 1.12, he said he was driven to the wilderness. He didn't want to go there. There was a burden that he could not deny. It came upon him so heavy and it began to tame him. If you understand true Christianity, you will become like Mount Zion. You will become like a fortress, a fortress that nothing can break because you, you, will, you will journey in the spirit. The activities in your spirit will be too much for you to notice external activities. Something will be happening in your spirit. It will be a rumbling. It will be so heavy that you will not notice when a brother spoke against you. Today, when somebody speaks against you, you go and create a gang. And then you sit down and you are strategizing. You are, they, where do you have such time? Where do you have such time? Today, we, we, when you see somebody doing well, you are looking for, you are full of envy. You want to kill yourself. How come? Why is it this person? How come you have so much time? What are the burdens that you carry? What are the things that drive you? It's so bad now that when you see people doing things, it's reaction. Because A did it and succeeded. B too wants to do it. C too wants to do it. Instead of living, we are now reacting. Because there are no burdens. The weight of life is shallow. But when Jesus said, I am come. He didn't come to replace the things the devil took. No. If that was what Jesus came to do, it would have meant the devil was giving him assignment. The devil would have been sending him on an errand. He didn't come to replace the things the devil did. Jesus came to bring you into a world where the workings of the devil will count for nothing. Jesus came to introduce you to a realm and a dimension. You live in that dimension and everything the devil is doing counts for nothing. That's why I said the light shines in the darkness. The light doesn't even notice that darkness exists. He is too established in a dimension that darkness no longer counts. So what Jesus came to do was not to replace what the devil took. Jesus came to introduce you to a world. A world that brings you to a new civilization. And make you become an extension of that world. So when you breathe, you bring that world to bear. When you speak, you bring that world to bear. Everything you do becomes an expression of that world. This is true Christianity. 
and when a man begins to live like this he is actually begin to, beginning to grow into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ tonight you will ask the Lord Lord give me another measure maybe the measure you have is not enough the cares of this life have swallowed that measure so because there is no house rent you lose your prayer life it's not your fault the measure you have is not enough maybe the, the bitterness of people the backbiting of people became too strong for your measure and it choked it maybe the iniquity of your environment everybody is fornicating everybody is lying everybody is doing yahoo yahoo it has become so strong it has choked you maybe the people living around you don't pray they are just talking from morning to night and because you don't have enough measure instead of colonizing them they have colonized you you want to ask the lord this evening give me another measure give me another measure my goal this month is to show you the things that matter because if we begin to fly you miss why we came you won't know why we came you think we came to do what others are doing no we came to teach you the way of the spirit and if you will align with it you will mature in three months much more than you have grown in one year ask the lord tonight another measure give me another measure i know i'm a leader i know i'm a pastor i know that i'm popular people call me names but give me another measure give me another measure give me another measure the measure i have immorality crumbles it the measure i have backbiting crumbles it the measure i have lies crumbles it give me another measure yeah. church the quarry and that quarry in church is what chokes their life it's not even in the world do you know setting witchcraft is among brethren in church where we should come to absorb life that's where many met death do you know certain persons is in their offices that they died from the politics, the backbiting choked them and they died. Do you know some persons? It's in their businesses. There was not enough measure. If you don't have enough measure, your Christianity is religion because it's not about activities, it's a business of life. They say if you ask, you will receive. And if there's something I want you to ask tonight deliberately is to ask for more life there are too many things happening around you that wants to choke life out of you and for some of us we are already suffocating we got to pray we can't pray anymore we carry the bible to read we sleep off we can't read the scriptures because life is choked we are almost in the state of coma spiritual coma so you want to cry to the lord pour more life upon me release more life Asking for life. You were blessed by the message you just listened to and wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior. Kindly repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, and that he died for my sins and was raised from the dead for my justification. 
I therefore confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. If you just say this prayer, please send us an email on amodiscipleship at gmail.com or reach us on our website orocomichael.com to enable us to reach you and afford us the privilege to disciple you. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed this video and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also, if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.